Matt Watson, welcome to my podcast. Thank you very much, mate. Mate, it's great to have you here. I've got um, I got some questions and some notes here, but chatting with you for the last twenty or thirty minutes just outside, I, I don't know if I'm going to need them. Uh, you're an easy yeah. conversationalist, and it's a hell of a story. First of all, I think it's worth mentioning you turned up um, five minutes before you turned up. You called me asking me if I wanted a coffee, uh, which I think yeah. says speaks a lot about you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think it's just uh, uh, manners. I think maybe. Yeah. Um, I, I'm. Honestly, grateful um, that you know you got you reached out and got in touch with me and um, wanted to get me on. And I guess I've I still still feel like that um, every year. <laughs> like you're a re- like you're a no. reluctant celebrity. Oh, yeah. you know, see, even that word. That <laughs> word um, I'm conscious that um, people know who I am these days, but every year, honestly, uh, when it comes around to the start of a new series, I think look this is the year everyone's going to be sick of me you know and and i'm going to have have to disappear so that's why after 20 years i just feel so uh, grateful that i've chosen to to end the the tv side of it at least anyway and um yeah people have been saying the nicest things so anyway mm. there was a long winded way of saying thanks for having me on yeah oh no 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 uh, yeah in a way um so we're recording this just as the um the first episode of the 20th season is about to start yeah. um it must feel like an, a bit of um, like an obituary or something. Um, no, it doesn't. No, no. But you get, you're getting yeah. all these flowers and all these accolades, no. and it's like, oh shit! Yeah, like, yeah. as part of you thinking, oh, people actually really do love this, and uh, am I doing the wrong thing? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, well, so there's two parts to that. Um, no, I, I'm not doing the wrong thing. Like, I just feel like so sure more sure than just about anything that i've ever done that um it's the right time to wrap up the tv side of it for a number of reasons but um yes people do and i was i was not going to do this last series like um we did a tv series um building a house which was um, in the bay of islands it did really well on telly it took us three and a half years to build it and i i felt like once that house was done i put so much energy into it i was just gonna hang out there affect my homebrew and um, decide, <laughs> you know, decide on my next move from there. But it was then I sort of looked at, you know, and, and social media is, is one of the good things about it is, is it's an opportunity for me to see what people think of the shows and stuff. And people are like, can't wait for the next series. When's your next stuff coming out? And I realised how much people, you know, after 20 years, people have grown up watching the show. And I'm like, it's not right for me to just go, okay, well, that was great and let it kind of fade away. You feel well, like you owe it to the yeah, fans? I do, and I owe it. I owe it um, and I wanted to do a season where um, I wasn't going into the season going, man, I have to make this work to make it rate so I can keep my sponsors so the TV network stays interested. I've come into this filming this season with going, I don't, I have nothing left to prove. I'm just going to have a real good time shooting this last season. So I did it for myself as well. Um, and then last week, just putting a post on social media saying, well, look, hey, we're, we're wrapping up the TV show. And a number of people say, I'm crying. I don't know how to break it to my kids. It's like, hang on, I've not died. You know, I'm still <laughs> going to be releasing content. <laughs> yeah. It's just not going to be on, it's not going to be on telly. So, yeah, it is a, um, a sort of surreal thing in that. But I, I certainly don't see the um, obituary side or, or the... It doesn't feel like an ending. Okay, well, no, but end, end of an era in a way. But yeah, um, yeah. but I, I feel like you're uh, you're probably getting out and cha- pivoting at a good time because um, I think that the medium of TV, free to air TV, uh, especially, is dying. And now there's a way you can do the content, release it on your own sort of um, digital platform, and uh, it can still reach the people, even Absolutely. a greater audience. Yeah. So I, um, we started a um, television production company. Me and um, my mate Keza. 22 years ago and we um i i liked mad fish tv and kieran liked tight lines television and we <laughs> so so to sort it out we wrote the names on a bits of paper and we pulled it out and our company became tight lines television um, which i ended up um, kieran uh, after a few years went off on another career path and i stuck with tight lines television eight years ago i looked at that name and it had the word television in it and i went to the company's office and i changed it to tight lines media because I could see eight years ago, the writing was on the wall yeah. for, for, for TV. And that's when we started Ultimate Fishing TV, which is our own platform where we could post our content straight to the audience. But when you've got TV contracts, they get rights to everything first. And we couldn't release any of that content. So 
TV was still getting our all of our energy and all of our, our best content, but that platform was slowly chipping away in the background. And then if I got time, I'd go out and I'd shoot something specifically for our online, uh, for our social media, and um, it just grew and grew. And it's still growing by 4,000 followers or subscribers a week. Wow, what's, your, what's your YouTube numbers? Um, YouTube is not great. Uh, about 200,000, I think. Okay. Well, um, I'm, I'm so sitting here with, I just clicked over 3,000 this week. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> to me, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are going, like, I mean, I, I still like, we're mid production on this last TV series. And honestly, all my energy is going into that to try and make it the best TV series I've ever made. And after two decades of doing this, you deserve this um, freedom and flexibility to do things on your own terms. But let, let's go all the way back because it's such a fascinating story, the Matt Watson story. So you, you're sort of raised in like a fishing environment, fish, family of commercial fishers. Yep. So that's what you always sort of wanted to do. Yeah. And then you have like a fist fight at a Christmas Day cricket match? Yeah, um, well, my fist didn't really get used because I got knocked out pretty quick. <laughs> so, so how old are you at the time? Uh, I was 17. 17. Yeah, and, so, and so your uncle gave you a hiding or something? Oh, like? hit me with a cricket bat. Cricket, <laughs> 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 cricket bat. Yeah. Like, ex like accidentally or, um, or no. struck you with a... So, yeah, uh, let me establish <laughs> let, let me establish this a little bit. You're better. painting a very interesting yeah. picture of the Watson family as a oh, broader yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> we're a very competitive family, big family. Oh, God. And we've got this uncanny thing where we've got an even split of left and right handers amongst the blokes so on Christmas day that's how the teams would be divided lefties versus righties and uh, we do volleyball um, touch rugby and backyard cricket and um, we the righties we'd done pretty well in the touch rugby which ended up being more like a game of league by the end of it um, we lost the volleyball and it came down to the backyard cricket and it came down to the last ball. <laughs> and like, you know, you imagine hot summer's day, everyone's had a few tins on Christmas day and it was me bowling to my uncle in and he owns the, you know, he owned the commercial fishing boats. I'd been, I'd worked all my school holidays and, and weekends for him since I was 14 and I'd built up enough sea hours to get my skipper's ticket. So my plan was, you know, basically come straight out of school and go and work full-time for my uncle, you know, r running one of his boats. Um, I had told mum I was going to go to uni. She wanted me to be the only male in my family not to be a commercial fisherman. Um, I think she you know, I think she wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor or something <laughs> and pinned all her hopes on me because my brother was a dropkick. So, <laughs> sorry, Benny. Um, <laughs> it was a joke. Um, and um, so, yeah, so... I, I remember feeling so happy that running into that Christmas feeling my last exam is behind me. I'm never going to open another book in my life. I'm just, you know, my life's going to be out in the ocean catching mm. fish. And um, so, but it all come undone with one bowl of a cricket ball. So I knew my Uncle Ian couldn't play a fast straight Yorker. <laughs> Um, for those that don't know, the Yorkers, the, a, a high speed delivery aimed at the toes. And he was hopeless if you pitched it up fast. So. I come in all the way back for the clothesline and coming off the long run up and I ripped it in as hard as I could. Maybe because I had a few beers that came out the hand wrong and it was a beamer, a full toss that just got him bock right in the middle of the head, like sconed him. <laughs> and because it was the last ball and we'd already had a big argument about no balls in backyard cricket yeah. and the bloody lefties had said, nah, there's no no balls in backyard cricket. So we win, right? And so I'm high-fiving my cousins and everything. And I see, could see my uncle running at me with the bat, like holding it up like he was going to hit me. And I thought, nah, he won't hit me. But he did. <laughs> he did scone me with a cricket bat. Um, We're about to over, like over the arm? Oh, over well, the body? Well, well, the head? I, well, I got my arm up and it kind of glanced off my shoulder, which was a good thing. And it got me in the jaw. And of course, anyone that's been whacked good in the jaw knows. And I thought, shit, I can feel my legs going here. Like, And then next thing I know, oh, bloody hell, I've fallen over. My legs are gone. And then next thing I, I noticed is my dad, um, who was also a lefty, um, but you see, at the moment my uncle hit me with a cricket bat, the teams kind of split. We went back to tribal family roots. <laughs> yeah, so, left, and, yeah. left and right's out. Yeah, left and right's out. Now it was, yeah. It's war. Yeah, so the old man come and punch bloody uh, Uncle Ian in the face. I was just like, oh. oh my God, it's an all-in brawl. It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. Aunt, Auntie Glenn has had the hose out, hose it, trying to hose oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Yeah, it was a horrendous scene for a Christmas day, you know, family gatherings, you know, and um, yeah, I saw my commercial fishing career disappear as my uncle did a burnout off up the road in his ute, he, uh, last parting shot he threw a coffee cup at my ute, 
uh, on the way past, and I thought, oh man, I guess I'm not going to be a fisherman. But um, I had another uncle, um, or my auntie Glennis's boyfriend at the time, was uh, a roofer, and he said, oh, you want to come work for me? And I said, yeah, sweet. I didn't even know what he did. It was the same day. Same day. <laughs> same day. <laughs> One door yeah. closes, same another door yeah. opens. And, and that's how I became a roofer. I, so, because I, I, I've heard this story before, the, the Uncle Ian one. Where, where, how does he, how's the relationship now? How does he oh, feel good. about you telling no, the yarn? No. Does he love it oh, or embarrassed? Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Well, we've never really spoken about it. <laughs> um, I, in a lot of ways, I've, I mean, because it's such a good story, right? And yeah, a lot a of ways, and a lot of ways, I feel bad about it because he's a good guy, right? He's, great guy and like he was my hero growing up you know he mm. was the greatest mullet fisherman in Weymouth he's done incredibly well for himself but uh, I don't know what it was it was a, it was pretty, it was like a, if you a get hit with, hit with the ball like oh, you're, you're in a rage and he yeah, probably yeah. immediately regretted it oh yeah oh absolutely yeah. absolutely but you know we're from that area you guys don't talk about that sort of shit we just um you know see each other next Christmas. The, the very the very next time I saw him was the very next Christmas day. <laughs> we and, and downgraded to a tennis ball well, for safety. No, no. We see my mum banned banned all sports. <laughs> <laughs> all sports were banned for about four years, and then when it finally came back, and it was actually um, back at um, Uncle Steve and Auntie Glennis's place again, um, we we said, "Come on, let's look. We're not going to get into a punch up again. Let us play backyard cricket." <laughs> and we'd been going about five minutes, and I jokingly just gestured to throw the ball at my uncle Ian and my mum pulled the stumps out of the ground and we got another two nah, nah. <laughs> we, got, we got another ban <laughs> so yeah I mean yeah I mean it wasn't on but you know I, I do um, in a lot of ways feel bad because he's not a, a, a violent man yeah. or, or anything like that it was um, you know it was a, and, and, I, and I don't bear any any ill will you know yeah. like at all that's you know, a great whatsoever. story yeah. but you're painting a picture of your family is, is, is it a bogan family um, no, just say well, it's a broken family. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because it's my family. You're you're in it. You just be your family, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I mean, we we're from all of us from South Auckland. So Wayne by the way, I, 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 don't, I don't mean bogan as a derogatory term. Oh, I know, no, no, no. I I would just um, say Kiwi working class, uh, hard working um, mm. family, like and. Everyone in my family's done done really well through hard work, mm. um, you know. So I, I always had that as not just with my mum and dad, but you know, aunties and uncles. I I just great role models for people that just got up every day and worked mm. hard, knew how to party hard. Mm. Yeah, work <laughs> and, hard, and, play and hard, play hard. Yeah, and it, and it was the it, it was the mantra then. Like literally, I think it was my generation that started saying that. But it was our parents that we saw doing that, you know, that mm. just going to work and working hard, never complaining about it. Um, and then, and maybe, maybe to be fair, probably playing, you know, in, in the light of 2023, probably playing a bit too hard. That was like <laughs> the, the, the peak of <coughs> Kiwi binge drinking culture era, yeah, I, yeah. I, I feel, anyway. Yeah, because you and I are about the same age and it was yeah. definitely that generation where, you know, eating is cheating. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> no songs in the hydraulics, <laughs> mate. But, yeah, it was like, all of that macho shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah it's great. Yeah, there's another another term which um, sounds derogatory, almost like the word bogan, Kiwi battler. I feel like you were like a Kiwi bat Kiwi battler I sounds like someone that's um, has nothing but bad luck after bad luck, but I, I sort of frame it as differently. Someone that's just grinds and works fucking yeah. hard and yeah, gets so what they're after. I, that's a wonderful compliment. Like, mm. I don't I don't see that derogatory at all. Yeah. I, um, I um, see someone that works hard... Um, Whatever their circumstance, um, whether they manage to get ahead or not, hopefully they do. Um, Kiwi bat, I just see that as a really mm. kind thing to say about you, somebody. Oh well, that's cool because yeah. you, you're you're like you're a guy, and we'll get into the whole Matt Watson story. But you've um like in spite of every obstacle that's that's come in your way, uh, like you you know you've defied the odds and you've made your own luck. Yeah, like in a big way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I get told I'm lucky all, all the time. And it used to really annoy my wife. We'd go out somewhere and people would come up for a for a photo or to say g'day or whatever, and they'd say, "Oh man, you're so lucky. You got the best job in the world. You're so lucky." And oh, Kane would be life. like, "Why don't you tell them about you know how much bloody stress you're under and all that?" And I'm like, "No, that's that's if if they think that I'm out fishing every day and I've got the best life in the and I do have a good life. Like, I'm not complaining about at, at all. Um, that means that." I'm I'm portraying that dream, you know, mm. and and if they're watching that, going, man, that guy's got it easy or got it good. Well, I'm doing a good job, so mm. I I would, you know, I wouldn't want to b 
break anyone's illusion. And if I turn around and said to them, actually, mate, I'm just about gone broke. I don't know where I'm <laughs> going to find the money for the next series, you know, and all of this sort of stuff. Um, you know, th that would kind of ruin that. Yeah, because um, you're sort of a, like an unlikely TV star in that mm. TV's always been one of these um, industries where there's there's someone sitting at the top that either gives you a tick or a cross and decides if you're going to be on the TV or not yeah. going to be on the TV. And you've just sort of like penetrated your way through in yeah. spite of that gatekeeper. That's and right. it's remarkable, mate. Yeah, and I've butted heads with a few <laughs> gatekeepers and, and there is no way around them. Like if they decide that, and that's why I've had to switch networks, like, we, and sometimes it felt like the higher the show rated, when, like, when we were just winning like all genres, like head to head with everyone, we were just rating the pants off of things. A lot of the people that were working at the TV networks were people that had their own ideas and dreams about TV shows that fail. Mm -hmm. And um, I only found out this in sort of retrospect. Um, and I don't know whether it was professional jealousy. They're like, who's this guy that was a roofer who's never been to media school, never mm. done anything? Who does he think he is coming in here and getting ratings like that? Mm. Um, and, the, you know, I, I had the words quoted to me from a TV exec, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. You know, ratings aren't everything, Matt. I'm kind of like, well, if we're not rating, <laughs> ratings are everything and you're gone. Yeah, they live and die by the ratings. Yeah, they get I them know. every fucking day. So we had to bounce around networks and I was <coughs> constantly trying to convince people that it's worthwhile but the main thing that allowed us to keep going was that they weren't paying us it was no cost so it was no cost no risk and our sponsors bore that risk mm. like we're going to fund the series and um, I know people think they're sponsors but for me like honestly ITM Fishing Show it's got the name ITM in it and it would be just the nothing if it wasn't wasn't mm. for them and um, you know, I'm just not, I'm I'm not here on your show to try and plug ITM, but oh, no, it, it mate, mate as, as an independent creator, you can plug them all the fuck you oh, want. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And and I'm I'm well aware of the situation you get. Like they come on in the early days when when you've got nothing. That's they right. come on with good faith, and maybe because they like you as a person, and then five years, ten years, fifteen years down the track, it's easy for one of their competitors to come on and try and counter offer. Yeah. Um, when you've already established, but they're your day ones. Yeah, exactly. And so, um. Not just ITM, a lot of the sponsors that we had at yeah. day one, um, I get hit up, particularly like, you know, fishermen. Like, um, fishermen are passionate about their gear and everything they use, and, and a lot of them will look to me and they'll like, um, and I'll get hit up at a boat show or even at a, a pub or something. Okay, Matt, look, if you weren't um, sponsored by Stabbycraft, what boat would you actually have? And, you know, and what, what wagon would you be towing it with? What, what <laughs> tackle would you use? And I say to them, you know what? Before I'd even thought of the idea of a TV show, I had a Stabycraft boat, I had a Toyota, I had Shimano Tackle, I had Furunigo, I had all of those brands and I paid full retail for them and I've still got them to this day. And yes, all their competitors have come along, some have offered me some crazy mm, money, mm. Um, but um, I, I'm i a loyal person and um, um, don't get me wrong, if their gear was rubbish, it would be a different story, but you know, I was, I was that... Um, enthusiast wanting to do my research and buy the best gear and I, I felt I did and I've stuck with them and they've stuck with me and it's and that has been a massive part of the success of the show um, and um, loyalty um, can be hard for some people I think in terms of commercial terms when you're being offered a lot of money in the long term it pays off because mm. um, it's not only I mean let's say um, uh, opposition to Stabycraft comes along and they offer me um, a bunch of money and I go, yeah, I'll take it. That's a good bunch of money. And one day I'm saying I love these Stabycraft boats. Next day I'm saying... Thanks, Hunter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm saying that. That doesn't just uh, affect um, Stabycraft. That affects all of my sponsors because they rely on um, the end user getting my honest opinion. Yeah, that all and, and all of a sudden they're like, hang on, Matt, weren't you saying this? Maybe you're just saying wh what you're being paid to say. And I've always prided myself on if, a, if one of our sponsors bring out a product that I don't think is that good, I'll try it. I'll just say, look, you best not for me to use this on mm. the show because I, I won't bug it yeah. if I don't think it's good. And sometimes I'll even go back and, and tweak it with my recommendations, wow. which is incredibly um, flattering. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, to anyone that's doing anything um, in any kind of business, I would say if you're in it, really in it for the long haul, um, be loyal. Um, you know, you might think in the short term that Jesus isn't going to pay off but it, but it will mm. okay so let's go back so uh, there's um the punch up with Uncle Ian and then another uncle offers you a job as a roofer yeah so you become a roofer 
This is where where you have the um, the testicle injury. Yeah, yeah, the, the epiphany. As I call right, it. Right, right. <laughs> so, how long had you been roofing at this point? Um, I'd been roofing at that point, so this would have been I would have been roofing for almost six years, five yeah. or six years, and so this is your lot in life. You yeah, think? this is well. Um, or did no. you did you still like have? Um, were you missing the ocean? You I missed the ocean. Of, yeah. So I I'd become um, more of a recreator. Recreation. I mean, I always recreationally fished when I even when I was doing my commercial fishing with the family, but once the commercial fishing door closed, um, it opened up this you know this thing called weekends. Um, whereas <laughs> you know I could work all week as a roofer, and then on the weekend, I'd hook my boat on um, and I would tow it, and I could go up to Hohora, um up north one weekend to chase marlin. I'd be down Fakatane the next weekend chasing tuna. It'd be great. I was just going on these weekend adventures w- with my mates and. I was just like, man, this is awesome. Um, but I and I knew I was going to get back to fishing. I had to. It was in. It was in me. It was in my blood. I wanted to be a fisherman, and my way of being a fisherman again was I was going to be the hardest roof tiling tiler ever. I was going to squirrel all my money away, and one day I was going to buy a big game fishing boat. I was going to move to the Bay of Islands. I was going to take people out on fishing charters, and that was my way of getting back to this full time dream of of being in the ocean every day. Um, and that was exactly what I was doing. And then the, the more successful the roofing business got, the less fishing I was doing. Because I found myself, you know, I, I got up to 11 staff at one stage <coughs> and I was working weekends. And I'd worked, I know, must have been close to three months straight. It was in March anyway. And it was a most awesome day. Perfect. Mm. It was a Sunday. Perfect day for fishing. And of course, I wanted to be out fishing, but you know, uh, Fletcher, Fletcher Construction needed me to put more <laughs> roofs on. So, and I had the contract, so I was doing that, and I was just I was on the roof. Um, only one of my workers had turned up because it was a Sunday, <laughs> young guys, you know. <laughs> and um, I was thinking about what it would be like to be out on the ocean, and that's because my mates had rang me just as a, just before I went up the ladder, and said, "Mate, it is the calmest day we've ever seen across the Monaco Bar." You could water ski across here, and they're saying there's guys on the radio hooking up on Marlin. And I was like, man, I wish I was out there. I was just looking around. There was not a breath of wind, and I was setting the roof out, and I was walking backwards, and I was thinking, thinking about being on the ocean. And maybe I should have been thinking about <laughs> where I was stepping because <laughs> stepped over the gutter, one leg either side of the gutter, and it was a, um, a sharp metal edge on the inside. And we're in the old rugby short shorts; don't afford much protection, so. My, f- my first thought actually when I hit was, shit, I've just entered the gutter and it's going to cost about 400 bucks to replace it, so I'm working today for free. So I was pissed off that I'd just damaged the roof. Um, and then my next thought was, oh, shit, where's all that blood coming from? I could see like, blood oh, like dripping. trickling down your leg. Oh, no, no, it was actually at that stage, it was dripping down onto the roof trusses below me. And I thought, fuck, there's quite a lot of blood. And I'm like, where am I bleeding from? So I so stood you, up. You weren't, you weren't in pain or anything? You just no, bewildered? Sure. Oh, I, well, uh, no, it was the old... At first it was, no, it was the, th- took the wind out of me. It was the old kick in the nuts feeling. So mm-hmm. a bit, bit doubled over. Um, and then, of course, you get a bit of adrenaline when you see some blood. So I thought, shit, that's not very good. And I just sort of... <laughs> no <laughs> one wants to see blood from that part of the body. I know. So I slipped my hand in the side <laughs> of my shorts and it just came out covered in blood. Oh. And so... So you had undies on under the shorts, though. Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah no. Oh, you've got a... I'm, I'm from Rewa, but I've got a certain amount of decline. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, ouch. What next? <laughs> okay, so first aid time. Um, go to the ute. Um, put my feet on the dash. Adjust the rear view mirror to assess. And... <laughs> So, but of course, before I do this, I've got to take my my shorts right off, <laughs> and I it felt really weird, like being on a building site, taking my bloody my shorts, my undies off. But I, I had to to see what the damage was, and all I could think at the time was because I'm I'm not, I'm, I'm not that great with blood. Well, not that great with my own. Like mm. anyone else, I can, I'm I'm good. But I, I don't like, think I don't, I don't think many people many, many people are. It's quite no. alarming. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't. My actual thought was, is. Shit, if I pass out here, the plumber's due on site in about half an hour. He's going to find me with no pants on, <laughs> fucking pass out. He's going to wonder what the fuck's going on. <laughs> but, um, so, um, so anyway, I'm like, right, man up, Matt, you've got to do this. So I put my feet on the dash, adjust the rear view mirror, and then I saw what the wound looked like, and I was like, oh, shit, it's bad. What was it? Was it on, on the penis or just the no, testicles? No, 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 the, uh, like between, no. Between the ass and the, there's a name for oh, it. Oh, the gooch. Yeah, the gooch. Per- per- perineum. The go- perineum, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I knew it was that. Probably call it a perennial or something, but anyway, um, yeah. So, so, so the gooch was 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 like an axe wound, right? So, um, 
Oh. I grabbed I grab my, f- my my first aid kit out, and the first thing I saw was a roll a rolled up bandage, and it was just the right size to jam in the hole. So I jammed that in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Medical term. Yeah, yeah. Jam it in the hole to stop the blood coming out. Yeah, and um, and then I was like, I've got to kind of keep it in there. So I was um, and it, the bandage wouldn't stick to anything because of all the blood. So I got a roll of insulation tape, and um, <laughs> I'm literally in my ute. With insulation tape, taping my cameras back together, and uh, my f- the phone rings and it's my mates again, and I could hear them just shouting like just absolute ecstasy. They were so excited. And they're like, "We got a triple hookup of tuna!" And I could hear one of them thumping on the deck. I could hear beer bottles clinging together. These guys were beside, and they were so excited. They wanted to ring and tell me they've got these massive tuna on the boat. And I'm sitting there, and I thought, "Holy shit!" You know, like. I would love to be out there having a beer with these guys at eight thirty in the morning on a Sunday, just <laughs> absolutely, you know. And but here I am, taping my balls back together at work, and I haven't had a day off for months. I'm like, what in the hell are you doing, Matt? Um, you know, yes, you know, um, working hard's good, and I'll get there one day. But why don't I do it now? So like, I literally drove to the medical centre, got myself stitched up, um, and I. You know, went back, picked up Clint, my work gear, dropped him off. And all this time driving, I'm thinking about how I'm going to change the course of my life. I'm not going to be the hardest working roof toddler anymore. I'm going to get fishing. I'm going to get back on the ocean as soon as I can. And so I, I walked into um, the place where I was living and my girlfriend comes in. She's like, holy shit, look at that blood all over you. What happened? I said, don't worry about that. Here's what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get my brother to run the business. Well, um... I go and sit my skipper's exams and get my skipper's ticket. Once I've got my skipper's ticket, I'll better get a job working on a game fishing boat so I won't have to buy one, you know. It's not 10 years away, and I can work on someone else's boat. We can move to the Bay of Islands, but before I move up there, I'll about to want to get my OE out of my system. So once I've got my skipper's ticket and a job, I'm going to take off overseas, I'm going to play rugby over there for a bit, travel around, see Europe, go to the beer fest, get back for the next game fishing season, spend the rest of my life in the Bay of Islands. She was like, whoa, shit, slow down. She was like... I don't even know if I can get time off to go to Europe. I'm like, oh, it's all right, it's all right you're not coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So well, was that was that Kayleen? That's Kayleen. Who's, yeah, who's that now your, your wife? Wife, uh, wife of 21. Gee, I should know this off the top of my head. 21 years. Right. Yeah. So was that? Would you describe that the uh, like the roof thing? And the, uh, is it like an epiphany? Yeah, or? it was. It's quite. It shocked me into it. Like, look, I always knew I was going to get there and be a fisherman. And I always knew I was going to um, live in the Bay of Islands after um, I went up there with my mates when I was 16 and we got there in the dark and I, I woke up in, in the old bloody back of the van, opened the opened the door and it was daylight and we are just stopped next to this beautiful bay and I said to my mates, I'm going to live here one day. Like it was just, and so I always knew I was going to go there. Like I was going to live in the Bay of Islands, but like I say, I just thought I'd have to work a lot harder and a lot longer. And then, it, and then that, that changed like just, Honestly, the thinking of my mates out there having such a good time and what I was missing out on, I'm like, why wait till I'm, you know, my body's broken from roofing for mm. another 10 years and by that stage I'll be mid to late 30s probably. You know, I'm in my, my mid-20s now, like, I'm in a prime of my life. Let's get up to the Bay of Islands. And, yeah, I did, I did exactly that. So did you do the OE? Yep, I did. Yep. With, with Kayleen, without Kayleen? Without Kayleen, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I oh, know because that, right. that was well because it was like and it's, that sounds terrible in the light of the, in the light no, of no, now. No, not at all. It, it does, you know. So um, we were, I think we were engaged. I'm not sure actually. Then we were we were engaged, or at least we were we were well and truly shacked up, you know. So um, and uh, I'm I'm really grateful to Kayleen that she was like, oh, okay, well it's something you got to do. Um, and a lot of my mates were over there, so I I went into the OE and geez, if you don't mind another. Digression. I I actually um, I did my ACL coming off of a table at the beer fest um, that year. That so it was two thousand, and I think it was the Essendon Eagles had won the AFL, the Aussie Rules thing. And I didn't don't follow that Aussie Rules. So I don't know who these guys are. Well, they turned up at Hofbra House at the beer fest. All these big strapping Aussie lads just on the lash. They were on a bender after they'd won the won the AFL, or a bunch of them were. And I ended up just sort of drinking with them, and then. I somehow ended up in a wrestling match on top of a table and I, I came off second best and kind of came off the table and I knew I'd done my knee uh, when, I, when I came off. So I um, had to go to a um, hospital in Germany and I had medical insurance so the 
the German doctors wanted to do surgery because they could just rack it up on insurance. The insurance company in New Zealand wanted to fly me home for the surgery. So I said to the, the doctor on the phone back in New Zealand, I said, well, how much longer can I do on this trip before I come home for surgery? <laughs> and he's like, oh, look, you want to be back within the next three or four weeks. So I literally did a runner from the hospital <laughs> on crutches. Uh, and the efficiency of the Germans, as recently as two years ago, they've tracked me down in Northland and they've got the invoice for the crutches. <laughs> like Amazing! I know, Go get over it! Yeah, so, but anyway, I ended up um, backpacking around Europe on crutches which led me to, we ended up in um, the Vatican, um, you know, it was something, and, and I befriended this Aussie um, guy on, on a bus, and we went to see what this whole thing was about, because the Pope was in town to do a special service for his Jubilee year, um, and we, um, there's all of these, and it was mostly priests, and it turns out it was invite, you couldn't get into the Vatican on this day, because all the best parishioners had been invited to this service for this jubilee year and they had like there was like charlie and the chocolate factory the golden ticket to get in through the <laughs> gates of course we didn't have one we we're just a couple of you know kiwi and aussie bloke um and we're like oh well we found out we couldn't get in uh, that day but it was pretty cool to see all these excited um catholics i guess um and we we're just wondering wandering off and a priest came and put his hand on my shoulder and he said oh you know bless you my son you know you've come on a long pilgrimage and i was like oh yeah. So did you have the crutches? Yeah. yeah. So he thought I was a cripple. And so <laughs> so I was like, here's an opportunity, right? I can work this. And I've got to be, it's a fine line. You don't go lying to a priest, right? He was an American um, priest and he was in his, his full priest gears. So I said, oh, yes, Father, you know, I've come on a long pilgrimage. And he goes, oh, you're here to see the Father. He had a name for the Pope, the, the something grand Poo bar, whatever the name is, they call the Pope. And I'm like, yeah, I am, but alas, um, I don't. And he goes, oh, have you got your pass? And I said, no, no, I, I, alas, I, do, I don't have one. And he said, oh, look, <laughs> brother so-and-so from Texas couldn't make it, um, so I'll go and speak with, you know, my. and he'd gone to this little huddle with these other priests, and he came out and he had a, he had a pass for me. He says, you know, the Lord's blessed you today, and, and you can come in, um, you know, to see, to see the Pope. And I was like, oh. Thank you so much, Father. Um, what about my caregiver? Which was <laughs> <laughs> Your Aussie and so mate. my Aussie mate, and they got it. They got him in as well. And so, um, yeah, all because I got what boozed. a scam. Yeah, so I got I got boozed and got wrestled an AFL guy, blew out my ACL, and um, yeah, got to see the Pope because of it. Um, but yeah, I came back to New Zealand, um, had the surgery, and um, yeah, moved to the Bay of Islands and started working on what I thought was going to be my forever job. I was going to work on game fishing boats for the rest of my life. Mm. I, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, uh, that was a hell of, I thought that was going to take a different tangent where like the Pope like fixes your knee or yeah, something. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, shit, no. We were. Um, <laughs> oh, so, okay, so you come back and you, you're fishing. Yeah. Um, oh, first of all. So, so yourself and Kayleen, what's the story there? How, how did you guys meet? How did you guys get together? Um, well, so we um, both went to James Cook High School. Um, we didn't really know each other that well at school, kind of knew of each other. We were um, we were a different year. I was a year ahead of Kayleen. Um, and then so when I uh, moved out of home, slash kicked out of home. Um, oh, I, was there a story there? Oh, just, no, just I was an egg, eighteen year old, <laughs> and coming home at three o'clock in the morning, feeling like I could make all the noise I wanted, right, and right. my dad. I oh, just young and selfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah just stupid. Yeah, just yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and um, and took exception to my dad um, calling me all the names under the sun and rah rah. rah. So like, oh, right, I'm I'm off then, and you know, th you know, I had a I had a V8 Brock replica, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't afford the real one, you know. Um, so <laughs> I threw all the gear in the back of my V8 and burned out off the driveway and went crashed on a mate's place for a couple of weeks until I found a flat and I landed on my feet because I, I got a flat in, um, in Monaco which was flash compared to Rewa and, and I was flatting with four girls um, which was great you know like most guys go flatting and it's pretty feral this place was tidy oh, yeah always you know? tidy people <laughs> cleaning up after you yeah yeah exactly and um, and it was only two minutes drive um, to the 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 popular nightclub in um, Manukau, which was uh, Broncos at the time, it was it was the Wild West back in those days. Um, and uh, one of um, one of my flatmates was good friends with Kayleen, and of course, you know, friends come over to the flat, and one thing happens, you know, but one thing leads to another. And uh, yeah, so that was when I was, I think we got together when uh, I was nineteen. 
So that is almost 30, mm. yeah, almost 30 years ago. Yeah, it's incredible. It's, an incre yeah. it's a incredibly, yeah. but I think it, like you were talking about before about the, um, the partnerships that you've had with businesses, it's like um, just that sense of loyalty that yeah, you have is. as a person. Yeah, oh, Kayleen's yeah. incredibly, incredibly loyal too. And obviously um, you know, when I'm taking off to Europe and being a, a selfish young guy, you know, um, I'm, I'm grateful for that as well you know and I, and I just think we make a really good mm. good team you know like um you know we are we're really good mates as well and um don't get me wrong it's um, like any relationship there's there's tough there's been tough bits you know there's mm, for sure yeah yeah there's been really tough bits but that's a massive part of you know um, any sort of success is stability you know like it's you hear about it in a lot of cliche terms like if you've got a really strong foundation you can do outrageous things and you can try things because you know you can always fall back and there's going to be someone there mm. so yeah yeah oh, i love that yeah are you, it looks like your eyes are uh, watering nah, up it's a bit. dust mate you got to you got to vacuum this room uh, a bit better mate do you find you're getting quite emotional as you get older yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I'm kid, exactly the kid, same. Kids make you look yeah. like that, and like um, I find it, um, you know, I, I can talk about you know things I've done in career things. As soon as I start talking about people I care about, well, mm. you feel it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I don't know what it is. Eh? I reckon for me it was probably uh, mid forties when it when it started, yeah. and it's um, it, oh, uh, I, I'm an easy cry now, but it's always tears of gratitude. Like yeah. you know, if, yeah, I, if yeah, I sit yeah. too long on something that I'm really happy yeah. about. Or something that someone's done for me. Yeah, oh, it's bloody cool, mate. It's, it's good to see tears in your eyes. Yeah, yeah, thanks. No, that, remember, it was a dust. <laughs> <laughs> that was no yeah, shame in that. Yeah. Okay, so we go back again. So you come back from Yoe, you're doing some fishing, and then the, the biggest TV show at the time is um, like the Sports Cafe. Oh, yeah. With, oh. So Mark Ellis, um, that guy, Lee yeah. Hart, Rick Salito, Lana Cocroft. Oh, Epic. It you'd was. never get away with it now. It's okay. a moment in time that'll never be repeated. Yeah. So you, you, you're not, as I said, you and I are about the same age. Me and all, everyone in my friends group, we'd all sort of start to talk like Mark Ellis. Yeah. And you did I exactly was, the same. I was the same. It was because... He was, know, so, he was what you wanted to be. He was, you know, he was a lad icon. Um, he was, oh, he was an all black. You know, a warrior. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the woman loved him. Like, obviously a good looking guy. Um, so like... And, and just charismatic a, and oh, funny. Oh, charismatic, funny, razor sharp, wit still is to this day. Um, so, you know, when I, you know, and, and, and when I first made a, a, the fishing video entry for Sports Cafe, because when they announced, it was actually Mark that announced that they were going to do a, a, a fishing video competition. And um, as an aside to that, because I, um, I know Mark quite well now, with us both being ambassadors for Toyota, so... Um, you know, I'm lucky to spend a, a lot of time with my, you know, boyhood hero, I guess. Mm. Um, he said that um, that was not a sports cafe promotion. He bumped into guys from Stabycraft and they said, hey, look, um, if we can, if we give you a boat, we well, better get us some promotion. So live on here, <laughs> out of the blue, he announces <laughs> that they're, <g> they're <laughs> doing a fishing video competition yeah. and the winners get to go to the Stabycraft fishing tournament. And Rick has since told me, he was sitting there going, what, what the, the hell? Is he? yeah. This isn't. So he'd done his own side hustle to get himself a free boat <laughs> to run a fishing video comp. But once he said it live on air, they can't dial it back. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I was in from sea, and it just so happened to be that I was home on a Wednesday night when it was on. I'm like, I'm going to enter this fishing video competition, and I'd never used a camera or or done anything like that. So I got some mates up, and and we made that video. And but as soon as the camera was turned on, I found myself. Not talking like me, but trying to talk like Mark <laughs> Ellis. Because it's like, well, I'm on I'm on TV now, I guess. Even though it was only a handy cam, I've got to have a, a larger than life personality. And that was who mm. was the, the role model. Yeah, because I've, I've seen um, some footage of you when you were like 16, 17, catching big fish. And um, yeah. you were you're like, and I, I don't know, maybe it's an age or a stage that you're going through, like the later stages of puberty or whatever. Yeah. But you seem shy and awkward. And I was, there's yeah. not a lot of um, like camera charisma going on. No. So it was um, with, with that sports cafe competition, did that sort of like plant, uh, sort of, I don't know, set the tone of who you are today and who we see on TV? Yes. Yeah, it did. I mean, so when, um, I mean, when you see me today on TV and I get excited, I am excited. Okay. Some people, are, even my mates have accused me of hamming it up, um, but I do. And, and the way, and if I could sort of wind that back, when my mates say to me, oh, look, you, um, you're hamming it up there, mate, like, um, you, we were out in the boat with you last week. You caught a 30-kilo kingfish. 
and you said, how about that one, boys? And that was about it and let it go. <laughs> Whereas I saw you catch a 20 kilo one last week on the show and you just about <laughs> did a back flip, you, were, you know. And I said, well, the difference is, and we were watching an All Black Scotland test at the time. And I said, the All Blacks win, it's good, right? And they're like, yep. I'm like, if you had bet $20,000 on the All Blacks to win, you'd be a whole lot happier. And they're like, hell yes. I'm like, that's why that Kingfish, I was so excited. I had to fly our guests across from Aussie. We'd had bad weather. We had one day to catch a big kingfish and we caught it. So that's the that's part of the excitement as well. Because people, you know, is is not just the actual catching of the fish. It's like, yes, I've made another episode. You know, like what and and yeah, I and, right. I, and, I, and right. I gambled it, and I gambled on myself. So yeah, so um, it it's it didn't so much set a persona, but it gave me like a um. Uh, a cloak I could put on. I wasn't, I wasn't Matt, the shy guy that just loved fishing. I was pretending to be someone on TV, and it was that same um, pretending or, or cloak that allowed me to do stunt fishing. You mm. know, like it allowed me to. I never once felt that I could get hurt if I was leaping out of a helicopter or jumping in with a shark because it was all pretend. Like it felt like it wasn't real. Um, it was. And yeah, and I, it suppose, was I, I suppose you get swept up in the moment of just g- getting can, this content. No, yeah. It's got to be now or never, and yeah. you're so in the zone. Yeah. I call it Kodak courage. Yeah. Like I'd do, I'd do things in, in front of a camera, you know, with a camera on that I would, you know, I wouldn't be out fishing with my mates and say, oh, I'm just going to leap overboard and grab that <laughs> shark now. No, why no, would that, you? No, <laughs> what's the yeah, point? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but in that particular era, that was what was working for getting us eyeballs, and I was in the business of getting people to watch. Yeah. Mm. So, so you win the the Sky Sports Cafe, the Sports Cafe competition, yep. the fishing video, yep. and then what? That's not like a big break, eh? No, D- does that not. just sort of plant the seed that I could do this yes. as a TV show? Yeah. So people, um, I just got feedback from people. Oh, that was really yeah. cool. That was really funny, and all that sort of thing. And but it didn't lead to anything. No, no, it didn't. No, no, no. I mean, it's a popular folklore that um, that was my big break, and you know. TV network started ringing me, offering a whole lot of money. I mean, that that didn't happen. That was mm-hmm. just like a, a flash in the pan. It was great. The best thing about it was I got to meet Mark Ellis and go and have a, a weekend in Invercargill with Mark <laughs> and, and Bluff, <laughs> which was, yeah, we won't talk about that. Um, but um, it, it planted the seed. As that's a good way to tell a story. You know, like we, I had an idea and I said to my mates, we'll film this, this and this, and if we piece it together like that and we edited it with two VHS players. Literally, we recorded onto one, we'd push play and then we'd record on the other one. Like literally the same way that you would pirate, uh, you know, because that was only editing. Amazing, yeah, old school it, dubbing. Yeah, well, just, you know, ripping off Terminator yeah. 2 from Video Easy, basically, <laughs> was, was my editing skills. Um, so... Um, I, I'd started um, around that time writing a couple of articles for New Zealand Fishing News and I had mates who were fishermen like, man, that was such a great read. I love that, rah, rah, rah. So I would um, bring the, when the fishing news would come out, I'm like, yes, I've got the cover story. And so, you know, I'd take the kids off and I'd make my wife, Kayleen, a, a cup of tea and like sit down, look at her, you want to read this article, you know, and I'd, it's like, this is going to be, uh, allow her to read something that I've produced and she'll go, It'll open her eyes to this incredible life that I'm leaving when mm-hmm. I'm when I'm not home. I would poke around the corner and she's already shoved it to the side. She's got new idea, <laughs> or she's she's, she's <laughs> reading about what bloody Kate and bloody William are up. Oh, I don't know, but yeah, she, yeah, she, zero, she just had no just com- zero fucks given yeah, about zero fucks. Like, um, and I was like, <laughs> and so the the actual moment when I thought, hey, maybe TV could be something I could do was. I was shooting handy cam footage out on the boats that I was working on and I was literally playing back some for my own viewing pleasure. I had the kids with me, they were little, in the living room. And Kayleen walked into the living room and she thought it was just me watching TV. And I didn't know she was standing behind me. And I just heard her say, holy shit, look at that. She's like, look at that guy grab a hold of that huge fish. Like, is that dangerous? I'm like... That's me. Like, <laughs> she's like, what oh, do you mean? Oh, you had like a mask and a wetsuit. Oh, no, no. And well, yeah, that, oh, well, there was the, the, the particular bit I was like from the back, you know, right. and um, there was a, I was leadering, what called leadering a mile, I'm pulling it up alongside a boat and then they can get quite wild so you've got to grab them by the bill and let, let the hook out and take the hook out and all that sort of stuff. <coughs> and she was watching that but and then, because of course she doesn't expect to see me on, on television. Well, I wasn't. I was a, it was a home, home mm. video playing, mm. playing through the TV. And when I said, that's me. She was like, that's incredible. And then she started asking questions. And that was the, f- 
when I realised, it was the first time, and geez, we'd been together at that stage 15 years, um, married for quite a few, and it was the first time she'd ever asked me about the ocean. Like, I could go fishing, and this is true, like, I've, I could go to Canada to catch giant bluefin tuna, and I can be away for two weeks, I get back, she doesn't ask me how the fishing is, she's like, uh, what movies did you watch on the flights? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> did you get an upgrade? What did you get me? Like zero fucks about fishing, like like none whatsoever. And so for me, this is like, wow, this is the way I can talk to more than just fishing enthusiasts. You cut through I, to a broader yeah. audience. Yeah. And I thought, you know, and, and I didn't rush out and, and make a, a, a TV show that next day. It wasn't like the big um, epiphany moment, like the ball gash. Um, it was, but it made me think about it. And it was just when I was sitting on, on deck on a boat and I love working on those boats don't get me wrong I, I loved it but it took me away I, I, I was missing 21st mm. you know my, my sister own sister's 21st I was missing kids first steps birthdays wedding anniversary all these sorts of things that you know I wanted to be around uh, with my family for so I was sitting on deck it was such a rough day it was a bit miserable and uh, we had a big tangle in the lures and I'm untangling this I'm like man I, I need to get back I needed a bit of control over my life and have my own business again, like I did when I was roofing. And but it has to be in fishing. I'm like, can't go back to commercial fishing because I kind of learned that a lot of the practices, even that I was involved in, um, was not right. Yeah. You know, we were we were doing too much harm to the environment. Um, there are some still don't. I, I'm not anti all commercial fishing. There's still some really good, decent people out there doing the right thing but a lot of it was no good. Mm. And it was too expensive to get into the industry, you know, to buy the quota, even if you did want to fish the right way. So I, thought, I can't do that. Um, I didn't, the, the charter industry was was a massive money loss. Like mm. I watched my boss who'd built this amazing boat. He was an ex-commercial fisherman, incredible fisherman, great, great mentor. I'd watched him go gray with, with worry of losing mm. that much money owning a charter boat because of all the compliance cost. And I'm like, so I can't go into charter fishing. I was like, and that's when I just thought, oh, I could make a fishing show. And it just popped into my head. And so I just came back and quietly went about researching. And like, this was my level of thinking. What do you need to make a fishing show? You need a camera. So I looked up the camera. Oh, geez, they're quite expensive. So I'm going to need some money. Go to the bank, see if I'm going to borrow some money. Bank says, no, we're not giving you a business loan. Because that's a very, Rightfully so. Yeah, that's a very shit business plan. Like, <coughs> you're a fisherman roofer. We'll, we'll loan you money if that's the business you want to do, but not for television. And um, But I had enough equity in my house, and I just went, great, I'm going to borrow this money. Um, yeah, 80, 80 grand, eh? 80 grand, yeah. 80 grand. So, okay, so, um, yep. so, so Kayleen, you're, she's your wife at that stage. Yes, wife, yep. Okay, so you're, you're a young married couple. Mm -hmm. Um one kid, two kids at that point. Uh, we had one kid yeah. at that point. Yeah, okay, so you've got a little bit of equity in your house. It's, yeah. it, you're borrowing, you want to borrow money on the mortgage for something that she doesn't give a fuck about. Yeah. Exactly. How, do you, how do you get that over the line? How does she have the faith or belief in you that this is the right thing to do? It was the old um, do it and ask for forgiveness. Um, I had... <laughs> Did you not need dual signatures? <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. I think. Mate, no, the, yeah, you, I, were, you I were having this no. up. You, you, you talked no, about no, it with her. No, this is the... No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, I mean... Yeah. Um, I did tell her I was going to the bank to get a business loan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't mention that it was going to end up going on the house because the bank had no no faith in me. Um, um, but Kayleen and, and she says it much more eloquently than me when I've you know you know I've heard her telling other people. Mm. She just said I I knew he I knew that he was going to do it, and she said you know and I, and I knew it seemed like an outrageous idea, but she just said oh Matt's always done the things that he says he's going to do. Mm. And um, fuck, that's, that's cool. Eh? Yeah. Having someone believe in you that much, yeah. and just, just no. Even if you um, don't have belief in yourself at certain yeah. points of the way, knowing that someone else, yeah, who knows you as well, if not better yeah. than what you do yourself, knows that you're going to yeah. make this decision and f figure out how to make yeah. it work. That yep. is so cool. And we did a lot of figuring out, yeah. man. Like a lot of figuring out. Like mm. I am so grateful for my naivety. Like if I had any clue, if, like if I was able to jump forward two years and see um, how um, many roadblocks would be put in mm. my way by um, advertising agencies because I wasn't going through them to get sponsors, how many roadblocks would be put in the way by the TV executives and all that sort of stuff. I would have gone, shit, now maybe Too this hard. is not such a good yeah. idea. Maybe maybe I'll just you know borrow the money and buy some quota and go back to commercial fishing. Mm. It's probably what I would have done. But um, 
thank goodness to my naivety, I just thought, I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to do it different than everyone else. I'm going to make it better than everyone else. And that will somehow, and I don't quite know how, and, and I kind of thought it would be a sponsorship model, um, it will result in getting money because, mm. I mean, look at, it was TV, right? Back 20 years ago. <laughs> if you're on TV, you're, you're cracking rich. it. Yeah, you're yeah, cracking yeah. it. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. And you, so, you do, so you make the TV series? Yep. Or you make the pilot episode first? Yeah, yeah we made the pilot episode, and that took like uh, 80 grand doesn't go very far, right? Um, particularly like we employed a little bit of help, me and my mate Keza, which I, of course I need, need to mention. He was, Keza was involved largely because he loved fishing as much as me, and he was the most tech savvy guy that I knew. I, Kieran set up my first email account for me. Like, I didn't have an email account. You know, I'd never been to a job interview mm. in my life. I just got jobs through people I knew and or starting my own business, you know, in the case of my roofing business. So this guy knew had a computer and he knew how to email. So he'd be a great guy to, and he loved fishing. So he'd be a great guy to, you know, come on this venture with me. So we got into that. But of course, Kieran was a graphic designer by trade and he was working at a full-time job at Yellow Pages. So he could help me out when he wasn't in his full-time mm. job course and um and we got in some other help the guy that had worked in television and all that sort of stuff but he was expensive to get him to come and help mm. us and everything i did that's not how you present that's a bad idea you don't get shots like that that won't work this is and he just rubbished everything we did um and i was like we're paying you a whole lot of money for you to tell us that we're doing a shit job and we haven't got that much more so you can fuck off <laughs> um and and so I got, that's when I got the manual and I, I read the manual and learned how to use the camera myself. And I was like, oh, well, if we try this and, you know, I'd, the old handy cam, the same one we used on for Sports Cafe, I got a bit of drain pipe and I made an underwater housing out of it. And then I got a torch and, make, and found a pencil camera, a security camera I could fit inside it. And I made that swim behind the boat. So I started coming up with these innovative ways that literally cost nothing. Um, to get footage and we got all this amazing footage like we filmed some incredible stuff but then we've got to put it together um, and that takes um, skills mm. and money and we didn't have the editing skills we've never done it yeah it's worth it's worth pointing out at this point so this is 20 something years ago so yeah. it's not not like there's an no, app for everything now. you can do app, no. what you were doing then you can do anyone can do on their phone yeah you, you, can't that you couldn't Google it yeah. even. Like you can't just jump on Google how do you edit a, a TV show or yeah. anything like that it was um, well, especially me. I mean, I didn't ever, I'd only just got an email account, you know. So, <laughs> like, you know, you go down to the library and, like, get a book out. Yeah. It was, uh, I didn't do that because I don't read either. But, um, so it was just about, like, I'm, I'm going to learn how to how to do this. So, um, and one of the, the first things we did, and, and because we had a lot of this really good footage, is we put together a DVD. But that wasn't, like, a TV audience thing. That was just the cool fishing stuff that I was doing, mostly on the boats that I was working on, and we released it, and fishermen loved it. Like, DVDs were big at the time, you know? And that gave us a little bit of income to, to make this TV pilot. And one of those DVDs got in, they went around the world, got into the hands of a producer at the BBC. And somehow he tracked me down, and I got a phone call at home um, in the far north, and it was a guy, and I remember his name was Rod Stewart, which I thought was oh, yeah. and, like, <laughs> and he was Scottish as well. Um, wasn't the Rod Stewart. He was a producer. He introduced himself as a producer for the BBC, and he wanted to know how we got this incredible Marlin footage. He said, we've spent over half a million pounds trying to film Marlin up close. He said, we've got some distant shots. Um, he said, look, if you could please tell me what camera you were using, what underwater housing, what lenses, and what propulsion unit you were using to get right up close to these marlin, because we were really struggling. And I said, oh, mate, um, the camera's a Panasonic Handycam I got for a wedding present. The housing is a bit of drain pipe from under my house, that, um, and uh, I, I siliconed a bit of Perspex on the front of it. I drilled <laughs> a hole and got an eyedropper and made that waterproof so I could hit the on-off button. I had no way of seeing what I'm filming. Um, I got a surfboard tie down and strapped a couple of handle, handles to it. And and I didn't need a propulsion unit to get close to the marlin. I just made the marlin come close to me. And I do that by towing lures behind the boat. When they come up, I jump into the water with live baits tied to my arms. And then the marlin are trying to eat off of my arms. And I've just got to hold my shit together <laughs> enough and not drop my nuts with these marlin racing around. And he said, mate, 
if, if you don't want to tell me, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and he honestly thought I was taking the piss. But that was the level we were at. It was like, have an idea, figure out the way to do it. And we figured out a way. Oh, it's, it's the epitome of that old um, saying, you know, number eight wire mentality, is, yeah. which is n- not something you hear all that often these days. No. But it is just, fi- yeah, figure out how to make yeah. it work, whatever it takes. You know, um, I think Google maybe and YouTube instructional videos has maybe killed a little bit of uh, ingenuity because... Oh, probably. When yeah, you can find an answer for anything you yeah, want to do. Yeah, you can. And sometimes in finding the answer, you can actually find a better answer than what's conventional. Mm. And... You know, and and in the benefit of hindsight, that was a a massive asset for us because Mm. here was this thing that made it to TV and it didn't look like any other TV show because it was made by guys that didn't know how to make a TV Mm. show. They were passionate about fishing. Yeah, so so you had no preconceived idea. That's right. So we could, like, you know, and people would always say to me, oh, man, it doesn't feel like I'm, I'm watching a TV presenter. It feels like you're talking to me. And it was like, well, I'm not a TV presenter. I'm a fisherman. And I'm speaking how I would speak to my mates um, when I'm not pretending to be Mark Ellis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it gave it a new look. And mm. it, it wasn't intentional. From the time that we realised it was intentional, uh, that it was popular, we're like, yeah, let's just stick with this. Let's, um, you know, I, I did get better just through doing it about how to do a piece to camera or something like that. Um but I found the most popular bits was when I would just get caught up in the moment. I was like, holy shit, we got to get this fish. And I didn't give a rat's ass whether it got filmed or not. I was just so immersed and wanted, you know, to catch the mm. fish. And they were the bits that people people loved. Oh, passion is really really infectious, isn't it? Like I've got, yeah. I'm, I'm like your wife. I've, I, I give zero fucks about fishing. Yeah. But you watch someone that is just into it and enthused and in the zone and you can't help but be swept up. Yeah. Same as, um, I suppose, a parallel is like Steve Irwin. You're yeah. seeing his enthusiasm Absolutely. and excitement about you know, crocodiles or snakes or stingrays yeah. or whatever. You get caught up. Yeah. So, so, how, so how do you get it on TV? Like you ship off VHS tapes to um, TVNZ, TV3, Sky? And Sky TV, yep. They're so the only options. Yep, they, they were our only options. So we literally went and brought a three-pack of um, video cassettes from Kmart. <laughs> we were going to go to the warehouse, but we wanted to look professional and get the expensive brand. <laughs> you know, seriously, <laughs> that, that was a business decision. Yeah. We're like, yeah, okay, should we get the like the eighteen dollar ninety nine ones instead of the twelve ninety nine ones? Oh, definitely, if we want to look professional. And we did have a cool logo because Karen was a, a, a talented graphic designer, um, and we sent it off. And I put the uh, proposal together, saying like, we'll be able to fund this because. Fishing's this really popular thing in New Zealand. It's underrepresented on television. We'll be able to bring in sponsorship, blah, blah, blah. And I honestly thought, like, I thought our pilot show was so good. You know, I really did. And, but all my feedback had come from other mates that loved fishing mm. as well. Um, and that was, um, and I should say in doing that, like, I'd show people the video, but I wouldn't tell them it was a pilot TV show. I told no one. Mm. So when I was trying to put this TV show together, Kaylee knew about it, Kieran knew about it, I knew about it. Kieran's partner knew about it. Um, I didn't tell my mum, my dad, brothers, sisters, none of my best mates. I didn't. didn't Why not? Tall poppy. Like I didn't okay. want to. I didn't want to be that guy who said I'm going to be on TV. Yeah. Like I mean, that's the that was the opposite of what you know at that time you wanted to be as a Kiwi bloke, someone who's going to stick their head up and go. Mm. And I'd heard it so much. And to be honest, like I heard guys go, oh, I'm going to do. I'm going to make a yeah. TV show about this. Oh, and I'd, I'd literally look at those guys and go, oh, yeah, you're dreaming, yeah, you mate. wank, you're yeah. wanker. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, and yeah. I just didn't want to be that wanker. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Because there is. I mean, there is a, there's a certain amount of um, ego, I guess, you need to have to be able to put yourself out mm. there. And, you know, that was at the time that, the, you know, the All Blacks would get criticised if they celebrated too much. That's right. That's probably about the time that where era, uh, Jeff, w- Jeff Wilson came along and had to score a triumph fist pump and everybody was oh, a little mate, bit, yeah, a little yeah, bit of showboaty. I reckon, mate. Jeez. It was. It's not so like he was doing somersaults or anything. It was no. like a fist pump. Exactly, mate. Now these guys do full theatre performances. Yeah. You know? like it's <laughs> chore- they, get, they get choreographed. Uh, all these choreographed sequences. Yeah, it's, so a, it's an interesting time, eh? Yeah, because, you, you, you know, you and I, we were raised about the same time and it's um, like vulnerability is a very big word now. Yeah, and it's it like is. that just wasn't the uh, environment we were raised yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. And so part of, um, like, so, so when we actually... You know, did I'm jumping forward a bit? Managed to get it on TV. I didn't even tell my mates. I just invited them around for a barbecue, and flipped the telly on, and um, telly comes on. They're like, "Oh, are you on Gone Fishing?" Which is one of the shows. Like, no, 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 this is my show. They're like, "What do you mean your show?" Oh, it's a show that me and Kezza made, and we put it on telly. 
And um, one of them, <laughs> first thing one of the boys said, Thomas said, oh, you think you're fucking Tom Cruise now? <laughs> 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 and I'm like, that's why I didn't tell you. <laughs> Just yeah. making sure you don't get too ahead of yourself. Exactly. Yeah, and th- that yeah. was five minutes into episode one, series one. You know. Yeah. So that was on. So that was on Sky. How, how come there was no money exchanged? Like they, um, they, they, they. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're thirsty for content, I guess, because they've got are. so many channels. Yeah. So they'll play just about anything. But yeah. why? Why did they never offer you any money? Um, because it was kind of seen that like you are lucky to be have this opportunity to right. be on be on TV. Now, you need to go out, because we've given you this amazing opportunity to put your show on, you are now got a platform to go and raise some, some sponsorship. So, of course, you can't, it's a tough ask when you're a, um, you know, a roofer fisherman, you know, setting up a meeting, and, and I managed to get a few face-to-faces, most of them that were email rejections and or over-the-phone rejections, but mm-hmm. I, I got to the stage of getting a few face-to-faces, and I had some encouraging meetings for the first series. But ultimately, um, you know, we would show if we found a marketing manager that had an interest in fishing, he could see the potential mm. of how good it was going to be. But it would usually get killed when it got set off to their advertising agency to be assessed. They'd come back and go, "No, nah, no one's interested in this. It's not going to work. It's going to fail. Keep keep your money." And that's largely because of how advertising agencies work. Mm. Like they get a they clip the ticket on what the company spends, and if it was a direct spend, they're not making any money. So they're not going to want you know, a sponsorship unless it goes through them. Um, and I wasn't having any advertising agencies ringing me up saying, hey, we want to pitch you to, you know, a few companies. So I got no's, no's f- from everybody, you know. Um, so um, I thought, well, if we can get it on telly, you know, yes, it's going to be a cost and it's going to be a stretch for us to be able to do this. Um, but once it gets recognised, I should be able to get sponsorship a lot easier. Um, it did help, obviously, having something that would, on TV that had done well, um, but the TV um, networks and then when we next went to TV and Z, they were the same. They, they were like, "Hey, we want this show um, because we want to compete with TV 3s fishing shows, um, but we're not going to pay you for it." And so, how, how do they expect you to get by? Um, or just they by don't raising care. Ra- they, they don't they don't care. Yeah. They've given you this. Oh, mate, you, you're you've you've really got to go cap in hand because. It's not like I can go, oh, screw you guys, I'm throwing it on YouTube. Back then, YouTube mm. was in its infancy, and it was like, I think, two-minute videos, yeah, long max. Yeah. Um, didn't really have the audience. Like, if you wanted to get something out uh, in, in front of the eyeballs, you needed them. So they dictated everything. You know, they were like, this is the time slot you're going on, and, and we're not going to pay you. I mean, unless you were like literally in the click, and to be in the click, you needed to be here and here in Auckland. I was in a shed in, in the far north. I wasn't having bloody um, coffees, um, you know, down there with these guys <laughs> just shooting around some cool ideas, you know, and letting yeah. them come up with the concept um, um, that I could go and with a fistful of money go away and do. No, so we were we were self funded. So um, we needed a sponsor to be able to pay us to keep going. Um, and I always felt like we, we were going to get there, but it just came, it came really, r- real close. Like. So were you, were you grinding hard, like oh. sending off like proposals all oh, over yeah. the place? Or yeah, over like, yeah, and everyone had said no. And and my I I'd already had a rejection from ITM, um, but of course it never made it. It got only got to my proposal only got to like a junior marketing person, um, um, a guy called Barnaby. Funnily enough, I just remember the name because it's an unusual name. If you're out there, Barnaby, hey, shame on you. That was <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I shouldn't say that. But he, no, he, he'd he probably take pr- pride in the story, I guess. Yeah, that that I turned him down. Yeah, it was yeah, the worst yeah, decision yeah. I ever made. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I rejected that show. Yeah, and um, no, a similar one too. When when going back a, a little bit before that, when we sent off our pilot show, the first bit of feedback that I got was, I mean. Our pilot had been del- sent off like 12 weeks earlier and we hadn't heard back boo and I was sending emails, I was ringing, like literally reception. Oh, can you book me through to someone at, oh, so who are you? Oh, I'm Matt. Um, I sent in a VHS tape um, <laughs> three months ago. Here's the tree, you know. Um, it was on the NZ Couriers, you know, like that's. <laughs> I um, didn't get the tracking uh, number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, can, you, can you get someone to call me back? No one called back. And eventually I got in touch with uh, a programmer at TVNZ and I said, look, she goes, oh yeah, it's it's here. It's sitting on someone's desk. I said, can you, look, can you please watch it, um, you know, and just 
I, I think you'll really like it and then I can come and, and we can meet and we can take it from there. And lo and behold, she rings rings back the next day and um, she said, look, we've watched the we've watched the first half of it um, and we've all had a good laugh. And I was like, oh, awesome, because like, we did try and mix it up and mm. add a bit of humour and that. She goes, no, no, we were laughing at it. She said, we weren't, she said, this is so ridiculous to think, she said, fishing doesn't belong on television and if it did, it wouldn't be this rubbish. And that's what she said. Oh, you're, no, you're adding GSC to this story. No, I'm not. Uh, she really? Said, she said, uh, it was just, what a bitch. it was a fucking mean thing to say. It was. And she said, look, she goes, um, uh, and she did say herself, look, it might sound mean, but I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to give you any false hope. If you've got another career option, you should take it because this isn't going to go, this isn't going to wash in, on television. Um, I remember her name and she's still floating. I'd love to bump into her because she was just fucking rude. Like, I mean, Oh, yeah, that's unne- no, was, no, no, that's a, that is unnecessary. It that was. is so uncalled for. I've only watched half of it, and we're all having a good laugh at you. Um, but so I was like, oh, well, that's one down. Yeah. Like, it, it wasn't the end of the road. Never ever heard back from TV Three at all. Couldn't. And um, oh, mate, that's heart. That's heartbreaking. How, like, how many people? You, you're, you're, as we've said, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a fucking battler. But how yeah. many, how many people would have that sort of, um, that sort of brutalness of that rejection, and then just go, okay, well, I, I got to stop now. Um, I got to I got to go back home to my wife with my tail between my legs and get back on uh, the roof. Yeah, like the uh, fact that you kept going. I mean, it's inspirational, bro. Oh, thanks, but um, yeah, so thanks. That's a that's a, that's a kind. Um, no, I, th- word, I think but but again, never been on a boat in my life. No. I'm, I'm uh, the same as your wife, but I think there's lessons in your story that yeah. a lot of us can take about like yeah. perseverance and Mate, keep pushing and keep grinding. There's lots of great Kiwis out there that are that battle, and whether they're setting up a plumbing business or doing whatever they do, that are get knocked back and they, they keep keep getting up and going and um, I what I had in my favour is I always felt that it was going to be a success like I I could see it like I was like this is the, the, it's the rest of the world that are wrong or it's the rest of the, of the media world that are wrong <laughs> I'm right fishing is the most awesome incredible thing in the yeah. world like I mean it's the most real reality TV um, you know reality TV is probably one of the most scripted things ever when I go out on the water, I go out with a plan and we write out a shot list. This is what we want to film. We, no one on that boat, including me, knows what's going to happen mm. that day. And just the most crazy things can happen and you get real drama, you get real danger. And I was like, can't people see this? It's made for television. It's so interesting. And there's this whole um, ecological dynamic with all of these incredible creatures and all of this stuff going on. And I just wanted to tell every, every and, and you know, for a TV exec to turn around and say this doesn't belong on television and it's rubbish, I'm like, I just thought she was wrong, you know. Like, I mean, I knew it was going to be harder if that's the perception, and and that was a barrier I was going to have to break down. But I was like, I've got to get better at finding a way to convince these people that it is good and that people will watch it. Just give me the chance. Mm. Oh man, yeah. Shit, you're, I mean, you, you, your kids are very lucky. You're a good role model. Oh, like, there's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot in this, like, yeah. like, and a lot of it might be stupidity. Like, yeah, it was. Like, yeah. Just, just blind dumbness. Yeah, you know? yeah. That is another. That is another naivety. Like, I, I naivety, said earlier yeah, on, a better word. I was. I'm so grateful for my naivety and just my blind faith that if I do something good, I'll be rewarded. And I was a bit, just a bit yeah. longer than I thought. So, so the ITM deal. When did that happen? Season. That's season two. Season so two. So you got them on board. So yeah. they, they they had like they got to see season one yeah. to see what it was all about. Yeah. So That's season one. Well, no they hadn't actually seen it. So like because it was on Sky and Bright, it wasn't, and they didn't put it on in a great slot. It was literally I was um, at the boat show with Keza, and we were in the run up to our second season. It was going on TVNZ. I was funding it again because oh, we picked up a couple of fishing industry sponsors. So Shimano and Hunting and Fishing had come on. Um, and which was good, so we had some income, and well, it was mostly gear, you know. So I was like, yeah, I don't have to pay for my <laughs> hunting. Gear. Yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, I got a couple of free fishing rods, and I got myself a, you know, hunting and fishing fleece pack, and I hadn't had to pay for it. So I thought that was great, but we needed a, like a naming rights sponsor to fund it. It was just not a sustainable model to keep going back to mm. the bank. Um, and we were at the boat show we didn't have enough money for a stand at the boat show but we had um, New Zealand Fishing News who I was writing for they had a stand and I said can we put a TV screen on the end of your stand and play some of our footage just to kind of promote the fact that we're making another TV series because remember TVNZ aren't promoting us they're not um, giving cutting promos they're not yeah. giving us a, they're just like 
we're going to put you on, be grateful, and now go out and make sure people watch mm. it. Because if it doesn't rate, we're going to kick you off. Um, so we're in the run-up to our first season on, on TVNZ, and we're just trying to hustle interest and, and stuff in the show. And a guy just kept coming back. I watched him walk past a few times, and I was busy talking to other people. And he said, that footage you guys got up there is incredible. I've never seen anything like it. He said, do you have a sponsor? And I said, no, we don't, mate. And he said, have you spoken to ITM? I said, yeah. And he said, um, and what did they say? I said, no. They said, no, thanks. And he goes, well, you've spoken to the wrong fucking person. And he Barnaby! Goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he gets on the phone and um, he, said, he said, look, can you get over to ITM head office tomorrow for a meeting? I'm like, yeah, I can. And yeah. Um, Who was he? Is um, he the he, CEO? He, no, he owned three stores. Oh. So, so the ITM are a co cooperative. So, the, all the stores are individually owned by, you know, Kiwi yeah. pe local people yeah. in, the, in the community. It's actually an incredible um, business model because it's people at grassroots, mm. you know. Um, and he obviously knew the the executive that run the head office, and he just said, "Look, you need to talk to this guy," and and he sent them a. Um, a link to the footage and they watched it so I walked in there and they'd seen it and they just said we've actually just done a survey and um, fishing is the number one interest thing above rugby above anything for tradesmen and I was like I'd just done that same research I paid out of my own pocket for this AC Nelson research which I sent to your guy Barnaby and he told me that builders <laughs> weren't interested <laughs> really he threw Barnaby under the bus yeah I know <laughs> fuck Barnaby you know <laughs> <laughs> you got yeah. him like a marlin <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so how much was the, the, I don't know if you want to talk about commercial no, stuff, but it, since it's I 20 years old, how was, much was the? The first fee was under 100k. Yeah. I think it was like 90k. So um, to give you an idea, like some funded shows at the time were getting 100k an episode. An episode, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we had but it's such a wasteful industry. Yeah, I know TV is an expensive oh, beast man. to make, but it's so wasteful. Some oh, of the to this guy, like, like to the I when I watch the credit rolls of shows, and I, and I, I've been in for twenty years, and I wouldn't call myself uh, a television expert by any I mean, and I'll see like a, a local production or an international production, and there's fifty people in the credit roll. I'm like, what the fuck were those people <laughs> all doing? Other than getting paid, <laughs> you know, yeah. every one of those names in there is getting paid, and I mean, that's a lot of money to put that put that um, show together. So yeah, yes, there is a lot of waste, and I'm not. Um, and television industry is facing a lot of um, challenges at the moment with viewership going going to digital. Mm. Um, I, and for the people that work in the industry, like the, the camera ops and thing wrong, the individuals that I've met along the way have all been incredibly professional. You know, whether they're the person, if I've been in an ad shoot and they're the person that they was calling up the car, everyone's awesome, right? But the industry as a whole, I, I don't feel bad for them. Because it's been too bloated they, for they too long. Too bloated, yeah. Too much fat, and you know, I found that you know, whenever I went into the TVNZ building, you know, after the show had been on for a few years, guys would be like, "Hey, Matty, love the show, bro. <laughs> love the show. Um, here's my card, man. If you want to go, take. If you need a guest to come on the show, and I was getting dished out all these business cards, and then one day when I was actually throwing all the business cards out, I, I looked through all these. Everyone was a manager. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone was a manager. Manager of community consultation processes. <laughs> manager of this, manager of that. And the only person I ever saw busy in that building was the barista. Like, they were flat. <laughs> <laughs> they were fucking flat out, you yeah. know. They're all down on the foyer just like, you know, in their skinny jeans and Chuck mm. Taylors. You know, and here I am, like, up north grafting away thinking, shit, where am I going to scrape up the money to make another series? That's and so Knowing cool. that there's so much money in the business. Yeah. Yeah. It was fr yeah, it must have been frustrating because the, the it must have felt like for you that money that is and that was on the business is tantalisingly close, except you can't it get was. anywhere fucking near it. Yeah, exactly. You, you're you're working your ass off, and but um, so ITM came on board. Yeah, eighty eighty k or whatever, and, and I'm guessing that progressively got better and better. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. Yep. It, yeah, it did. And it uh, just again, you know, I, I talk about having a, a strong foundation when they for the first couple of years understandably contracts were year on year like we'll give you one year and we'll see how it goes and then after one year it was successful and lots of builders watched it and the, there was their name emblazoned you know in our logo um yeah this is good we'll, yeah, we'll that, give you one more year that was another big thing like and that must have been a huge call on your part like to call it the itm fishing show yeah right not the fishing show you know powered by yeah, itm or whatever. exactly and yeah. that's but that's been a, a real uh big thing for them at, at the time mm. they they didn't have full brand awareness. Like a lot of people didn't know what ITM was twenty years ago. 
Um, so um, a part of their thing was like, let's get everyone to know know what we are. And I said, well, I'll, I'll put you in the logo. And part of that was because I knew that I could give excellent value to Shimano because I'm going to be using their rods and reels. I knew fish, whatever I was going to do, if I did it and well, they're going to go and buy their gear. Same with the boats and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to be carting around four by twos on the boat <laughs> talking about, you know, um, how good the uh, ITM's um, nail and trust plant is and, you know, how they always deliver on. I'm not going to do that in a fishing show. It's all about representing their brand in a, in a positive light. So I, I put it in the name and it worked. And then fast forward quite a few years and you'll notice that there's a, a subtle difference. Um, it was the ITM fishing show to start. It's uh, For the last few years it's been ITM fishing. And that's when the TV networks started making noises like, oh no, ITM are going to have to pay us if they want naming rights. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You guys haven't paid for the show. You're getting it for free. And they said, oh, we've just got this blanket rule. No no sponsors' names. They can be a broadcast sponsor and it'll be the fishing show brought to you by. So I changed the name across our social to ITM Fishing. I'm like, take the ITM out of it now. Are you going to call the show Fishing? <laughs> and and there was so much... <laughs> You're a pain in the ass. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to go fishing brought to you by I? <laughs> and, and so I changed all of our branding. And then I actually, we did our own research. And I found out that when the people weren't calling the ITM fishing show the ITM fishing show, they'd call it ITM fishing. Or they'd call it the ITM show. And that's when I reali realised how powerful that was. Mm. And I, how the association, people see me to this day. And if they can't think of my name, they'll go, oh, ITM guy, you're the ITM guy. So it had kind of worked, and I wasn't going to let the, the TV network take that away through a rule change mm. um, because, you know, I, I needed to look after ITM because yeah. they looked after me. Oh, I respect that. Yeah. Were, were, they, were they gutted when you told them you were pulling the pin? Um, well, we're going through that process at the moment. So, I, look, I... I'm going through the stages of grief. <laughs> no, it's not, not <laughs> grief, mate. It really isn't because... So... Um, ITM were one of the sponsors a few years back that were like, look, you've got to hang in there in TV. That's where we... And because it had been mm. successful for them and it had wor worked for them, um, they've got a really new um, forward-thinking, dynamic executive now, and they've seen what our digital audience is. And they know that builders are on their phones, they're online, they're on YouTube. That's where they're going to get the content. So, you know, you might not... Um, you know, the after the series, you're not going to be tuning in on a Saturday or a Sunday to watch the ITM... Um, fishing show on TV, but you're going to be getting it um, on our ultimate fishing platform. You're going to be getting it direct to social media, and it could be something that's 12 minutes long. It could be 50 minutes long. Mm. It's whatever I think is excellent. And so long as ITM want to stay associated, um, and I, I honestly hope they do, um, their name's going to be their name's going to be over it, and they'll be they'll be getting the credit for it. Because how could I not? You know, like th the actual truth is, it, the show wouldn't exist without them. Mm. Yeah, that's true, and and that is dead right. I I think I read somewhere like some sort of survey that uh, YouTube is the fastest growing like digital platform or TV platform, whatever you want to call it in the world. Like it's yeah, just it's the biggest in New Zealand. So yeah, so it gets massive. more eyes. It gets more eyes in New Zealand than than any of the terrestrial mm. or um, streaming platforms. Yeah. Jeez, we've we've been going for an hour twenty. We haven't even got onto the Letterman stuff oh, yet. Oh, far out. Yeah, sorry. So uh, no, 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 no. It's great, mate. It's um. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shit, you've, you've been through a lot. Mm. Like, just the, the dogged determination. It's next level. Yeah. It's bloody inspirational. So the Letterman thing, how, how does that happen? So this is in the early days of YouTube, I guess. And yeah. So, you, yeah, so by, the, by the way, that, that clip, the clip that caught Letterman's attention, that's you jumping out of a helicopter. Yeah. Well, that was the that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. It, 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 I'd already caught the attention. Like So I'd hand-lined a great white shark um, for a shark tagging pro. And, and that was out of necessity too because we didn't have any tackle big enough we figured out to pull these great white sharks in to get a DNA sample so we were fishing from a cray boat and I, I tied together some cray pot lines and made a hand line and pulled in this great white shark and and uh, you know th that were, the bit of that went online and then I did a um, I caught a marlin on an electric fence reel you know a bit of heat gain a bit of <laughs> <laughs> literally straight off the farm <laughs> ingenuity and so they were the first few clips that went online and, and got some virility. And, but it was like after the um, Gannett Man stunt jumping out of the helicopter just went batshit crazy mm. viral, like literally the biggest video uh, in the world. All the news agencies all around the world had taken it. Um, yeah, I just got a phone call. I, again, in my, in my shed, we had um, 
one employee at that stage, Kate, and we had the old school, you know, voice recorder, you know, to look if, if you've got a call overnight, yeah, yeah, leave, yeah, leave a voicemail. Yeah. So she, she checked the voicemail and she came in uh, and I walked over, you know, I, I had some pig dogs because I'd go pig hunting straight off the back of where our office was. And I remember I fed the dogs that morning and walked in the office and Kate says, oh, there's a voicemail here from the booking agent at David Letterman and he wants to get you over to New York as soon as possible. And I'm like, fuck off. And I had some <laughs> mates that were... I had some mates that were roofing in, in the States. Yeah. And I'd hardly have had, if ever I heard from them, they'd call at like four in the morning or something and they'd be boozed or something and they'd be like, hey, how are you, Tom Cruise? You know, be like, <laughs> you know like, <laughs> like giving me shit. So what what I, and, and because I was getting, like, I was started getting some press, you know, over and people were seeing this, some of my fishing stunts, like on news outlets and that. I figured that they'd seen it and they were ringing or they'd put someone with American accent up to make this call and pretend. And there was a number left that said, could you call back? And I didn't want to call the number back because my I was expecting one of my mates to be on the other end going, hey, you dickhead, you're not going on Letterman. <laughs> um, but Kate rang back and she's nodding to me like, this this is legit. And um, one of the things she said was, she put her hand over the phone, she said, they want to know what your fee is. And so this is 2009, show started in 2006. I haven't been paid to be on oh. TV yet. I haven't been paid by a TV network. So you're just barely scraping by making the TV show yeah, with yeah. the ITM cash. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, ITM cash, some of our other sponsors cash. And I've got, a, I've got a production company in New York wanting to know what my fee is. Well, I don't know what, a f what fee you charge, but I didn't want to go in too high because I don't want them to say, oh, shit, nah, sorry, nah, that's too much. We, we can't have you on. Because I'm like, I'm being invited um, to go and then Kate wrote on the pad in front of her business class tickets and she underlined it. I'm like, holy fuck, they're offering me business class tickets. I've never sat up in front of the plane before. <laughs> so I definitely didn't want to go and tie. So I said, tell them 500. <laughs> Five oh <laughs> my God. Seriously. I was like, tell them 500. <laughs> so she said, um, <laughs> and I'm standing right next to her <laughs> and she goes, uh, <laughs> She goes, oh, yeah, 500. And then she puts her hand over the phone again. She goes, they want to know if that's per hour and if you, when do you start charging? Is it from when you leave? And and I was just like, holy fuck, they've got, they actually want to pay me some decent money and get me to New York. And so um, we we settled on a fee. I got my paid for the first time. Um, what was awesome, it was the first ever trip Tanlin and I had done away. Because she didn't want to come on any of these fishing oh, adventures. So business class flights for two? For two, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. Holy hecka, that's amazing. Yeah, and that was because I gave them an exclusive. Because this, by the end of that day, the Jay Leno show, Jimmy Kimmel show, they'd all been, and they just said, look, they said, look, all the other shows are going to be in touch with you. But if you can give us like a one month where you don't go on, I, no, it wasn't even that long, two weeks, I think. Because um, I ended up doing the Today I, I did some other CBS shows, and then I did like Today Show and a few others shortly after. So I literally went from being making a show in a shed that I built myself, like as in dug the footings by hand, mixed the concrete in the concrete mixer, built this little shed, put a computer in it and called it and uh, Tight Lines Media, or uh, Tight Lines Television at the time. Went from there to um, sitting at the front of a plane with Kayleen, flying to New York, on Broadway in New York, and if anyone's seen the pictures of like, yeah, the Ed Sullivan you know, Theatre, it's oh, yeah, iconic. It is. So they put us up in a suite straight across the road from the Ed Sullivan Theatre, beautiful um, suite. And every time I looked out the window, I could see the Ed Sullivan Theatre. I'm like, fuck, tomorrow I'm on there, mm. you know. And it made me oh, so man, I've nervous. Got goosebumps. And I'm like, and and I guess it was a mistake, um, but I watched the ep an episode of the Late Show because I'm like, I've got a, you know. I'd not done a TV interview in my life. Like I'd not, I'd not done talkback radio. I'd not done any media. I'd just been out with my mates doing this outrageous stuff, and it was always it was always about scrambling to do stuff. But it was with guys that I knew. I'd done nothing live, so um, I get over there. I'm like, any mistake I make, there's no, there's no stepping it back or anything. So I was incredibly nervous about that. I watched the show, and the guests were. Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, who were in a movie together, they did the top ten, and um, Will Smith. And I'm watching these guys <laughs> oh God, going back them. and forth with David Letterman, like like guys <coughs> at the top of the game, like massive celebrities, but just how sharp their wits were, cracking jokes back and forth, back and forth. And I'm just like, fuck, I can't do that. Mm. I'm going to walk out on that stage and I'm just going to clam up. And I just 
like it, it made me so nervous. And Kayleen did an amazing job of boosting up my confidence. She was like, you know what? Um, fuck. She said, you know what? Um, being yourself, got you here. Mm. Fuck, she's a good one, eh? Yeah. Hang on, I got some tissues, tissues under here. If that you need happened, to. man. Well, I told you I can't talk about people. Yeah, but yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, it's um, um, mate, it's a, it's a it's a wonderful relationship yeah. you guys have got, and it's good that you um, yeah, you can appreciate everything she does. Like, oh, thanks uh, for the tissues, mate. Oh, you, <laughs> <laughs> does someone tip you off? Well, I, don't know, I usually have them up here because yeah, yeah. it can get quite emotional in here. Yeah. But um, I, I was I had them under the table because I thought oh, we won't need them no, for, no, for, no, for no, Maddie no, boy. No, oh, Maddie, mate, you'll be all right. <laughs> No, uh, that's cool. But, but I mean, it's, it's obvious, yeah, mate. The, the fact that she let you get a mortgage yeah. out on the house yeah, for this yeah. for this wild dream. And that's where it, and that's where it literally landed both of us. We were mm. in, on Broadway New, in, in New York, like at the, the epicenter of media around the world, you know. Mm. And, um, and she said, look, um, I know what will make you feel more confident. Let's, and she goes, it always works. Let's go shopping and buy you some new clothes. And I was like... <laughs> Oh, nice try. <laughs> See, I, I, I give about as much care about shopping as what Canyon gives about fishing. Yeah, and yeah. I, and I, that was the last thing I was going to do. And I was like, no, no. I said, thanks for the advice. It's great. I am going to be myself. So I'm just going to wear shorts and jeans. Yeah, yeah, like a half a t-shirt yeah, and like three quarter, three quarter Can't, cargos or yeah, something. Because they were my best pants. <laughs> But I, I think that's that's that suited yeah. that suited you. You you know you you can't be something you're not. That's right. It wouldn't yeah. it wouldn't have looked right if you if you went out there in a black suit dressed like fucking Will Smith. Yeah yeah exactly. So I, we went across there and it was it was Waitangi Day, which was my son's um, wow. fourth birthday. So four years to the day earlier, I delivered my son in the front seat of a truck, and a, that, that's another story. Oh, we'll I won't go down that. that but <laughs> that's a, it was ruthless. Um, but. Um, Walked across the road, it was minus six degrees, there was snow everywhere, and all the New York locals are all rugged up going about their daily business and looking at me like, who the fuck's this guy skidding? I was skidding on the black <laughs> ice and my jandals. And yeah, the jandals. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> toes are freezing. We walked through the backstage door just like we were told to right on time. Mm. And um, a young woman by the name of Anita said, look, I'm your assistant while you're here. I'll get you anything you need and, you know, welcome to the show. And she said, David's really looking forward to meeting you. And the booking people, everyone I'd spoken to had said the same thing. And I'm like, that's so kind. They know I'm a rookie. They're boosting my ego by, by saying that. And I was like, cool, so do I get to go see him now and we'll talk about what, what we're going to talk about for the interview? Oh, no, 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 you'll see David when you go out on stage. Mm. You'll be fine. I'm thinking, shit, they, they've got no idea that I've not done anything mm. like this before. But anyway, I'm, Kenny's still done a really good job of building my confidence. So we jump in the lift, go up, the lift door's open, and I see my name written on the door with a star above it. And my vision honestly went blurry. I thought, fuck, I'm going to pass. Like, they think I'm a celebrity like Will Smith or like... Uh, and I've just been... You know, I've, I still felt I was bluffing my way onto TV. I was, a, I was an imposter on TV in New Zealand, mm. and here I was at the Letterman Show, and I'm going to get found out, mm. like, big time when I walk out on that stage. It's like the saying, fish out of water. Now, now you know what it's it like was, for a marlin yeah, on the yeah. deck of your boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not many of them end up on the deck of the boat. But, um, yeah. but yeah, so like I did, um, I just felt incredibly nervous. And, and not too much, I'm, I'm pretty unflappable, you know, um, with the exception of talking about people I care about. Mm. Um, um, so I opened the door to the changing room, and the first thing I noticed was the mirror with all the lights around it. And I said to Kayleen, shit, it's just like the Muppets. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of people won't understand that, but yeah. from our vintage, yeah, you'd watch yeah, the Muppet yeah. Show. Miss Piggy used to sit in front of the mirror with all the lights all around right, it, yeah. and it was exactly the same. I was like, holy shit. And then Anita started cracking up, and I had a laugh, and that lightened things. And the next thing I saw, see was all the food that they had in the in the dressing room, and they had, like, um, they had some champagne on ice, and they had all these amazing canapes. And I thought, oh, sweet. So this must be where the feed happens. Like, because the other guests were Little Wayne, the rapper, and um, Isla Fisher, the actress. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was going to be Scarlett Johansson, which I was excited about, but they switched out late in the piece. But Isla, anyway. Isla Fisher's amazing, oh, though. No, married oh, to Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but anyway, so all like a billion legs bigger than wherever I was or ever have been. So I'm just kind of like, holy shit, I'm going to get to meet these guys. This is where the feed happens. And I said, <laughs> oh, so 
when do we have the feed like afterwards? You know, I'm kind of expecting it's like after a rugby game, someone's going to come in and do the big, the big spread of the table and do a cut of care, and and then you ha- you know the, the visiting side goes first and you have a feed and have a catch up and then everyone goes home. And she goes, oh no no, they've all got this in their dressing rooms too, and I'm like, there's a lot of food. <laughs> and she said, oh, it's f- I said, who's it all for then? She said, oh, it's for you and your entourage. And I'm just like, it's just me and the missus, and so anyway. I was way too nervous to eat. I hadn't eaten on the plane on the way over. I'd had half a slice of pizza and I felt like being sick that day because mm. I was so nervous about what I was about to do. So anyway, I go downstairs, go into the green room, and they then they walk me to the wings of the stage and they said, when you hear your name being said by David, walk out there, shake hands with him and get into it. And that's what I did. And it went like a blur. It felt good. He was, he ma- I think he made things very easy for me. Um, I cracked a bit of a joke or I, and I thought it would fall flat it didn't and what was it what was the joke oh, you well he asked well, it was, I, I told him about getting my ball slashed open <laughs> and, I, um, <laughs> and I'm like that's pretty out there for US TV yeah, it's like, very conservative it was they are very right. conservative for TV so they actually beeped like the, the bit where I said you know it's important um, to have balls doing with the shit that I mm-hmm. do uh, so they beeped that but it, the, the crowd laughed and that was a bit off-putting too because I'd never been on any sort of stage before, you know, I think school production maybe. Um, but the lights are so bright you can't see the crowd. And it was very cold. It was something that struck me as cold inside the theatre. The lights were really bright and it was just like black. And then as soon as people laughed, I realised how many people were there and that they were close but I couldn't see them and it was a bit off, off-putting. Um, but David just, he was really good. We had a good chat and quite a way into it, probably a little bit like this, I'm yarning away, and there's guys, you know, off stage, out of shot, giving it this one. I'll oh, wrap it, it up. Cut yeah. it, cut it. And, but David kept asking questions, and it ended up going well over, like two and a half minutes over the, which for US, like for the ratings they get, that's costing them mm. a lot of money because it's eating into the commercial time. And um, as soon as they cut for commercial break, the first thing he said to me is, I've really been looking forward to meeting you. Like, like everyone had said. I said, honestly, though? And he's like, I said, I saw you on here with Al Pacino. He goes, oh, no, don't me. they're all really good guys. But he said, they're doing their, they're on here to do their jobs and promote their movies. He said, it's just neat talking to someone that's passionate about something. I was like, wow, you know, you can just be yourself and you can get this far by not not pretending to be anything mm. other than the, the, than yourself. And it, it sort of... And, and up until that point, I had had no time to reflect about where I was going or, or the enormity of, of what was happening. And I remember going back to the um, dressing room, Kayleen was crying, trembling. Was yeah, well, she just with pride or... Yeah. 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 Shit. Yeah. Mate, that's awesome. Jeez, yeah. Mate, I've got goosebumps hearing this. Because I, I suppose for... I mean, you seem like a guy that's always just got your, got your head yeah. down, grinding forward. And I suppose this is like a, a, like a tangible moment where you can... Yeah. You know, rather than keep reaching for the next branch yeah. on the tree, you can yeah, pause yeah, exactly. and look yeah, at the view yeah. that you've created. Yeah, yeah, I'm, and I've, I've not done that because, c- and partly because it's been so busy. You know, it's mm. always been the next thing. Got to do the next thing. Um, you make commitments to people, to sponsors, so you're always busy trying not to let people down. Mm. So you don't, you don't have time to look back and say, "Geez, I did good," you know. But um, yeah, yeah, you did do good. Yeah. It was great, and then and then and then you did lines of coke with Little Wayne. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I, I didn't. Did you meet Little Wayne? Oh uh, yeah, so he was waiting for me. Um, when, was we, he? Well, when we got up the list, at least I mean I'd heard his music and I'd seen rap videos. And I, you don't strike me as being a Little Wayne guy. No, no, no. But I mean, um, but I came up the list, and there's all of these black guys. And one was particularly little. And he, was, <laughs> it he, was, he was. And I think my ears were still ringing from the nerves and the uh. adrenaline of being on stage. And he dapped me up, sort of bro shaked me, gave me a hug. And I think he said, that was cool, man. Like, that was cool, man. I think that's what he said, but it was my ears were ringing. And then he jumped in the lift and went down as I came out. And then that's when I went into the dressing room. Kayleen was trembling and oh, it was just like this, this moment. And then in the very next moment, I'm like, shit, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten anything other than half a slice of pizza for the last 40 hours. Mm. And I saw all this food. Trouble was, I had to go on a meeting with the big boss at Discovery Channel. Like, they were wanting to get my signature to do a deal, you know, an international broadcast deal. And um, so I couldn't stay and eat the food and and hang out to meet the other guests, even though um, Little Wayne and Isla had already actually gone. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, there was no after party. You know, <laughs> it wasn't like the post match at a rugby game. Um, so I just said to Anita, "Look, oh, you guys have the food," and she said, "No, nah, um, we're not allowed it." I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, and there was, there was salmon, salmon canapes, these amazing pastries. It was just all this beautiful food, you know, fresh fruit. And I said, "Well, what happens to it?" She goes, "It all gets thrown out because we're not allowed it." Um, because we had a diva she didn't name names she said we had a diva guest on a while back and she accused the staff of stealing the strawberries uh, while she was on stage so we've got this policy no one's allowed to touch the food um, because it caused this thing I'm like, oh, that's weird so I said oh um, can I have a doggy bag now? <laughs> oh god you didn't I did oh my yeah, god no, you I didn't, didn't. I did, well I mean it's waste you know <laughs> you know like it I wouldn't have been good it would have been a, the, that grey Atlantic salmon it wouldn't have been the good oh, I don't know <laughs> yeah. I mean no, I, I, I'm did, not so a real, did you actually I did so she went around she got the catering containers that was all brought in and she said no one's actually ever asked before but yeah sure <laughs> so I loaded them up I loaded them up <laughs> and I, I, I got heaps of the chocolate pastries because I thought I was going to go out and tear new after this meeting Kenny and I were going to go and tear New York a new one I had this weight off my shoulders and I thought when I get back booze, these chocolate canapes are going to, chocolate pastries are going to go down a treat, especially. And then she saw me looking at the champagne and she goes, do you want that as well? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I was like, and she goes, yeah, grab it. You know, she was like, grab it. So I tucked that under the wing because Kenny and I had never had, I think we'd had on a, on a one special occasion, we had had a glass of Moet um, once and it was but like, so I'm just like, yeah, this is baller. I've got champagne, got all this amazing like wedding food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wedding food. <laughs> it was, you know, you get the, a lot of the fancy yeah, yeah, like, little yeah. nibbles at weddings. You know, like this is well, you know, we had a wedding reception at the Weymouth Cosy Club. Um, <laughs> ours was more sausage rolls, but um, so we um, we go down on the lift, and I'm just like feeling so happy that I didn't, not that I'd smash this interview or anything. You didn't I, look like a dick. I didn't look like a dick, yeah. and I was honestly worried about letting New Zealand down. That was my thing. I was like, not many Kiwis have ever been on this show, um, let alone been like a main guest. And um, I wanted people to go away going, oh, Kiwis are like cool people. Um, that's what I wanted. So, and you know, I've always been real, real proud Kiwi. So, like, that was like a real mm. big thing for me. I was like, I felt like I went away. I said really good things about New Zealand. I made sure I got that in and said it's such a great place. And I'm like, yes, I didn't screw it up and my mates aren't going to be able to give me shit about it. Like, um, So I was just feeling really good. We get down to the bottom and we're about to go out the doors. I'm like, right, I'm just going to dump all this food um, over at our suite and then we've got to get to this meeting. And Anita said, oh, you're going to need these guys to help you get across the road. Like two big security guys. I'm like, no, we're sweet boys. We know where we're going. We're straight across the road. She said, no, you're going to need them. There's people waiting for you out there. I'm like... So I immediately thought, oh, the guys that I'm going with meeting with, they're waiting for me and we'll just go straight to the meeting. She goes, oh, no, the paparazzi. Here. I said, oh, who? Is it a guy called Michael? She said, no, no. The <laughs> Who's Michael? Yeah, oh, Michael was the guy from Discovery Channel. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I said, oh, she goes, no, no, no. She said, she looked at me like I was an idiot. She was like, she looked at me like, gave me that look. She was like, who's Michael? She was like, no, the paparazzi and, and fans are out there. And I opened the door and they had like some autograph hunters and they kind of had them in a pen, like pinned up. And then people the guys with the cameras yeah paparazzi i guess all shouting out my name and getting me to look their way and flashes were going off and i so i went outside and i hit the cold and i almost skidded over when i hit the ice um because you know i didn't have appropriate footwear on <laughs> and i just because because i slipped i sort of sucked in this big breath of air and it was freezing cold and my ears were ringing and the flashes were going off and it was incredibly disorientating and that's when i thought holy shit like it was this surreal out-of-body experience i'm in the middle of new york you know three days ago i was in taco bay cobbling together a tv show in a shed and people are shouting my name and and then the next thing you know kayleen freaked out and ran and i'd given her the pastries um because i i didn't want to be photographed stealing david letterman's piss and his food you know like so like when i knew there was pep i gave it all to kayleen yeah, yeah. i'm like shit like these guys want to take my photo i can't be like seen stealing piss so Kayleen started running and I would say two thirds of the, the photographers and this autograph hunters just chased Kayleen out of instinct because she was running. Mm. I guess what, that's what they're used to. They weren't used to me going, oh, this is cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah get well, out. Yeah, well, which is my good side. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, like, you guys want to have my photos? This is cool. And um, so there's just this crazy moment and I'm out there and the flashes are going off and I'm watching two security guys shielding my wife as she's running through the snow with 
people with cameras taking photos of her. And then the next, my next thought was, fuck, she's dropping the pastries. And she was. <laughs> there was a trail of chocolate pastries. And so the photo that, that was taken of me that went in the paper, I'm kind of like, oh, no, because like, of the photo. Because of the pastries, yeah, it was yeah. just—it was this. It was like an out-of-body experience. It wasn't, and to this day, it, it doesn't feel like it happened. It's so far removed from what I do now, and and going out fishing on a boat and getting some footage. Mm, what a cool experience it was. Yeah, cause Let- Letterman, um, Letterman was a massive deal at the time, and yeah. I, I was a big fan of him. But shit, he. He could be an absolute asshole if he had a celebrity he on, could. like a like a Paris Hilton or a Lindsay Lohan yeah. that he wasn't into. He would just he could be ruthless. He could be ruthless, and that's what I and that was was what I was um, nervous about. Mm. But he was, you know, shortly after, um, you know, I, I questioned him about saying, no, seriously, you? And he goes, yeah, man, I've been. Wa-. He said I was the one that wanted to get you on first, and he goes, they obviously have other producers, and and, and I, I, be, I believe he owns the company Worldwide Pants, yeah. it's the production company. But there's obviously other writers that have a say. He goes, I wanted to get you on ages ago when you caught that. And I think he said it was the big shark or something. Mm. And he said, but once you did this helicopter thing, he said, we needed to get you because mm. we knew everyone else was going to be after you. And I was like, wow. And he said, but, you know, I'd like to come to New Zealand at some stage. He said, I don't do a lot of fishing, but I like fly fishing and I hear it's good there. I was like, oh, well, mate, if you come down, you can crash on my couch. And, um, <laughs> but he, said, and he said to me, oh, I might take you up on that. Tongue in cheek, of course. He uh, he has a he hasn't phoned. <laughs> I haven't heard from him. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think he likes travelling very much. No, no. I don't know. But I don't know. I mean, it was it was ten and a ten and a half minutes of my life. It wasn't like we've got a bond. Yeah, no. No, but yeah. w- did you notice, um, like from your career perspective and what you do, there was like um like exponential growth after that. Yeah. Well, overseas, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I got back to like so, um, I had a lot of attention while I was in New York, and I mean. We, the network were, um, you know, th- they were driving Kayleen and I around in a limo. And when I was going to uh, meet the, you know, meeting meetings and stuff, they would have like a personal shopper organised for Kayleen to show her around. Like, it was like, holy shit, this is like the other side of TV, mm. you know? Like, yeah. um, so, and, and it, you couldn't help, I mean, I definitely wasn't rolling around like, check me out, like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big deal, but... People were recognising me, media were interested, and there was like um, the the people at Discovery saying, "Oh, look, you know, so and so wants to speak to you. We don't want to let you go on that show because of this reason and all that sort of stuff." And um, but I got back to New Zealand. There's n- it was just the people saying, "Oh, hey, Maddie, how's the fishing?" Mm. Most like it didn't make the news here. The um, it wasn't till some time later um, I w- um, that um, that I'd even been on the show and. Um, I was, I, I can't, I, I felt a bit, oh man, like, I feel like I've done a good job for the country, yeah. and I felt like, um, like, the the media in New Zealand should have gone, hey mate, that's one of our own, and he, he's done a good job, but that, that didn't really happen. Um, didn't it? Wh- why? And, and later, it, did, it was it was sometime later, it was when, um, the uh, after I'd done the Discovery deal, and they made it one of... Um, we did a show called Man vs. Fish with Matt Watson for Discovery Channel. Um, and it was basically all born out of the attention I was getting for doing dangerous things and how passionate I was about mm. the, the creatures in there yeah. and about, about the ocean as a whole. Um, but in, in true American fashion, they wanted to change it and make it more dramatic than it was. And they had, uh, and again, all of the big, you know, so I went from. Me, Kate, and Keza, oh, and Dave had started with us by that stage, um, you know, thinking oh, it'll be cool to go and catch this fish in this place and show people how cool it is, to like a massive production team, mm. like uh, hundreds of people, um, you know, being assigned a talent liaison person and all of this sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, that was a big change, but I didn't want the way that we went out and got stuff to change because I knew that that's what a it's a winning the, formula. Got me the success. Yeah. The producers thought different. They're like, we've got to bring in these other stories and it needs to involve Americans and we need to talk about things in American terms and all that sort of stuff. Um, and when I, f- and, and we, don't get me wrong, we, I worked so incredibly hard on that show. I kept ITM Fishing going during the same time. So here I was, I was the, the first person for Discovery International to sign a contract with 
have concurrent shows on Animal Planet, which was where Steve Irwin was, and on Discovery Channel, which was where Bear Grylls was. So, they, so and um, Steve Irwin had, you know, sadly gone passed away, Robert, passed yeah. away, and and you know, and and that terrible <coughs> accident. Um, so they were kind of looking for, hey, this larger than life character um, that was seemingly fearless but passionate and knew a lot about his his subject and and so they kind of pinned it pinned that on me which was great um i was paid extremely well mm. like um compared to like well, what i was cobbling together in new zealand and and they made it s- discovery got to got to dictate to all the other sub discovery affiliates certain shows that they have to take and man versus fish was one of them it's what they call like the headline shows like man versus wild and all that sort of stuff and Discovery do this big promo every year where they get their talent together and you've got to sing along of a line of a song, Boom Dia to the Whole World's Wonderful or something. And, you know, and it's like, that was just like totally out of like foreign to me that yeah, the Mythbusters yeah. guys were there. But anyway, they cut Bear Grylls out of it to put me in it. Like they'd already mm. done it, but after they signed me and that, and some someone in the media over there picked up on it. And we were actually filming in the States. We were filming in Oklahoma and that was wild. Like, man, those redneck boys are just there. You know? <laughs> you know, I thought there's some hard boys up north, man. Though. Some of those redneck boys. Uh, was, next um, level. They were next level. So anyway, we're filming there. And there's these, um, like the the um, affiliate CBS and I think the Today Show, like broadcast fans follow at the boat ramp wanting to interview me. And the questions were like, who would win in a fight out of you and Bear Grylls? And I'm like, well, I don't know. And I, and I think I said, me? <laughs> you know, like, you've got to back yourself. Yeah, you know I mean, and, and like, I just thought, what a stupid <laughs> question. But what had happened is there'd been some sort of a thing come out that um, Bear Grylls' agent was pissed off that he was, um, you know, they were in negotiations with Discovery, and he was. I think they were both playing hardball, and I think it was maybe a move by Discovery to cut him out of the promo and put me in it, and say, if you don't toe the line, we've got this new guy, mm. this Kiwi guy that's gonna, and we're, and we're gonna elevate him. And I think because the show was called Man vs. Fish, his was Man vs. Wild, there was some sort of discrepancy about the ownership of the name and nothing to do with me, right? Yeah. And so media are asking me questions like who would win it? And I've not met this guy, I don't, don't know him. And, and just in the, my typical dry sense of humour way, I'd said, oh, you know, I'd, I'd win. You know, like just <laughs> whatever, you know, next question. Yeah, it's, a, it's and, a hypothetical. Yeah, and and that became a bit of a thing. And yeah, and so everywhere we went, there was media in the States when I was there um, asking me about this, this um, you know, like rivalry, beef, beef with Bear, Grylls. Beef with Bear yeah. Grylls, and it didn't exist. Like, it didn't exist. I don't know the guy. Um, and so, but yeah, then I'd get back to New Zealand, and there was really kind of nothing. And it wasn't until it, it was released internationally, and then it was released in uh, Discovery Asia Pacific, so it was going to be on TV in New Zealand. And I wasn't proud of the show. Like, I mean, it was the, to me, it was the, the opposite of ITM Fishing Show. Every single episode of the ITM Fishing Show we ever made, uh, over 400 now, it was the best we could do with the resources we yeah. had. And I felt we were telling New Zealanders something about, largely about New Zealand, but at least something about the ocean, even if we were overseas. It's amazing. Like all the setbacks you've had, and we've talked about some of them, and all the rejections and everything else, and uh, things like this. It's amazing you don't have, you, you're not you're not more bitter or have more of a chip on your shoulder. Do you know what I mean? Like you're such a happy, positive guy. I I am I mean don't get me wrong I have uh, I I've had this thing in my life where I would stew on things and that mm. was one of them yeah you know, that that stewed on me you know like um um and and how I've um allowed myself to let go of that sort of stuff when I felt like I've been wronged or ripped mm. off or something I'll um I'll have the emails that the the prove it or the re- some or I'll even write it on a bit of paper and I've got a box mm-hmm. and I put it in that box. And I'll go, one day I'll write a book <coughs> about it. And 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 I, I can maybe vent then. I probably won't mention a lot of the, the wrongs. Mm. I feel I feel like when when that time comes to, yeah. to open up the bitterness yeah, box. No, I mean, it's just not in your nature, I no, don't think. No, it's not. It's not. But it allows me to let it go. Yeah, and the yeah. moment I close that and I put it in the back of the wardrobe and go, Well, one day I can I can vent and tell everyone what really happened, um, that allows me to and it's almost instant. It's like mm. oh, that's behind me, I'll deal with that another day. And um, yeah, and it's like the literal physical putting something into a box, putting the lid on it, and pushing it to the back of the mm. wardrobe um, allows me to move on. And then I'm like, right, there's some big fish out there to catch. Let's go. And, <laughs> and, I've, and, go. and I've got this idea yeah. of how I'm going to film it better than ever before, and yeah. just get on with it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a it's an incredible drive. Okay, so something that you mentioned um, maybe about ten or fifteen minutes ago that I want to go back to. I don't know if you want to go back to it, um, but the delivery of your son Shaw. Oh yeah. So you so you were on the way to hospital, and the, so the waters broke. Yeah, yeah. So um, so yeah, you del- I was in must have been terrifying. Yeah, so I, I was I was in, I, I'd started the show, um, but it wasn't paid. It was in the period where it wasn't really paying, so I was still doing crewing work, uh, working on a boat bloke called the Ultimate Lady because we. You know, we had an even bigger mortgage to pay for now and another kid on the way. So I was doing fencing work, farm fencing work, and I was doing crewing work when I wasn't, um, you know, put, trying to put together a TV show. And um, we'd already had Hannah and it was, I'd got him from sea, I think that day, and I was exhausted because we do big hours out on the boats. And Kayleen jumps out of bed about midnight and starts pacing. And I said, are we on? You know, do you want me to start the truck up? And she said, no, 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 it's not, it's not labour. She said, it just feels like bad period pain. And I said, get in the truck. Because that's the exact word she said 45 minutes before, Kayla, uh, before Hannah was born. 45 minutes before Hannah was born, she was walking around the room saying, it's not labour, it's just bad period pain. And I just remembered those words. I'm like, get in the truck. She goes, no, like stupid, it's bloody <laughs> one thirty in the morning and it was a storm, like a proper thunder, lightning, Hissing with rain, wild northland storm. And I said, I don't care, getting in the truck. And she said, don't ring the midwife. Don't wake Karen up in the middle of the uh, night for nothing because we're just going to go to the hospital. We'll sit there and we'll probably be we'll be back by. So anyway, I said, I don't care. Jump in the truck. We just about get out of the drive. We don't even get out of the driveway. Kayleen says, fucking drive faster. This baby's coming. And I went to give her the told you so. <laughs> and I went not the time and I, just, the it was, I made eye contact and it was, it was not the time to <laughs> say I was right. Um, and like we lived down like a real long gravel road, so it's not, not safe to drive fast on. And I was yeah. driving as fast as I was comfortable driving. And Kelly's going, Can you drive faster? And like I thought to ease the tension, I'll chuck some music on. So um, I flicked the flicked the radio on. It was probably you were probably DJing then. Mm. It might have been the well, not at that hour in the morning, but it was probably the edge because um, mm. the song was Salt and Pepper Push It. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and this <laughs> is true. This is the true story. <laughs> Salt, and so I crack up laughing. I look at Kayleen. She's not laughing, right? So she goes, change that fucking song. <laughs> so I, you know, it was still the old cassette. Push in the cassette. And unbeknown to me, where's your head at? And I was like, <laughs> ah, get it? Honestly. It's honest crowded. to God, they were the two songs. Yeah. And then I would go, and then... Still did Kenning still didn't think it was funny. So I was like, okay, no music. Just drive as fast as you can. And we're about, uh, you know, um, or in good driving conditions, probably 30-minute drive um, to the nearest hospital at Kawakawa. And um, we get about halfway there. We get to Pakaraka at the intersection, and Kenning says, I, I think we're going to make it. I'm like, thank goodness. Um, and um, bear in mind, so I've not even been to an antenatal class because I've been away at sea. Um, and you know, not for our first, not for our second. So I don't know anything about you know the pushing and the contractions and all that sort of stuff. And um, I don't know if that could prepare you. Nah, to, yeah. nah, nah, nah. And and I was kind of one of those guys. Like, geez, women used to have babies in caves. What do you need to go to a <laughs> class to learn how to have a baby for? You know, like I was that guy. So we're we're going down the road, and she said, like literally ten seconds after she said, I think we're going to make. She goes, nah, pull over. It's coming right now. And um, I said, hold on a sec, because I could see there, there was literally one street light uh, or two street lights together at the Pakaraka Way Bridge, which was the only bit of light between us and the hospital in the far north. And so I thought, well, if I pull up under there, I at least I'll be able to get some light to see how to, to do this baby thing. So when she said it's coming, I rang the midwife. And she was like, oh, you know, how are things going? I'm like, we're having the fucking baby at the Pakaraka Way Bridge. Can you get here as quick as you can? She said, yeah, I'm on my way. So... Um, I pull over there and I just think, oh, jeez, I'm in luck. There was a guy already pulled over. It was He was wearing his yellow raincoat. He, had a, he was in a white Honda. The bonnet was up. He'd broken down. And he thought I was pulling over to help him. And so he, um, we pull over and I'm still on the phone to the midwife. And I said, look, because I rung him and said, look, you might have to talk me through what I've got to do here. And I said, hang on, look, there's a guy here. I'll pass the phone over. So this guy's walking up to my window thinking I'm, I've come to help him. And I open the door to give him the phone, and he turns around and just runs, like sprints back to his car, dives in the passenger side, and I watched him going around locking all his doors, and he laid on the floor of his car. And I was thinking to myself, and I said to the midwife, sorry, that guy's gone. 
because there was obviously a lot of Kayleen's in labour, so there's a lot of noise and stuff. I think he thought I was giving Kayleen a hiding. Oh, right. And he freaked out. He's like, oh, there's this big violent situation going on. He ran and hid in his car. So I said to the midwife, look, I, I can't do this and talk to you. Just get here as quick as you can. And I, I hung up knowing that she was on her way and went around to the passenger side of the car. I know I'm soaked by the stage. It's pissing with rain. I opened the door and I said to Kayleen, uh, oh, I think you're going to take your pants off. Uh, to which she said, yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so okay, Dr. Yeah, Watson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, shit. yeah, and... and, and um, so, so, so passenger seat, reclined back as far as it can go. Reclined back as far as it can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Passenger seat, reclined so back as far as it can go. And so I you, are you sort of standing on the roadside or did you manage to sort of squat on the... I've, yeah, I was had one knee in the well, yeah. one leg outside the door because I was sort of there and um, I had a headlamp in the... Um, That's I, lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a you know always prepared guy. I actually had <laughs> half a dozen towels in the back seat for this very eventuality, knowing that, that Hannah came quickly. I actually had some towels ready. Oh, actually, I actually no, I had I had six towels folded up in the back um, behind the seats, ready in case. So I'm, I'm organising the towels and to, you know protect the upholstery. <laughs> <laughs> you got to think about like, the resale. I know. Yeah, exactly. No. Um, and, you know, it was hard to see what was going on there. It was a pretty tense situation, not ideal. Um, you know, she's she's pretty gnarly down there at the best of times, but there's a lot going on, you know. A <laughs> um, lot of fluid and stuff. Um, and But what I could see was, and we didn't know whether they are having a boy or a girl. We didn't find out for either. And um, was just very, very purple, like a lot more bluey purple than what Hannah was. Mm. And I thought, but this doesn't look right. Mm. And um, the cord was around his neck. And it was kind of like, um, so I ring the midwife and I said, she's driving, uh, I could hear her driving. I said, look, the cord's around his neck. Um, I, I, I should cut it. I've got, a, I've got some scissors here, I'll cut it. And she said, do not cut anything. Don't cut anything, just wait for me. And of course she's thinking, here's some guy freaking out. And you know, he's grabbing out some bloody, you know, some fishing pliers or something. <laughs> And he's going to cut an arm off, you know. <laughs> and so she said, don't cut anything. So I, all I was trying to do was get my fingers in between the neck and the, mm -hmm. you know, and it's all mid-happening. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, this is not good. And so she pulls up in a screaming halt right, right next to us and her little bloody hatchback. H and how much time had passed? What do you reckon? Oh, not long. Minute. Oh, okay. minute, minute, two minutes. Yep. Um, and she did, her parting shots were, advice was, don't cut anything and tell Canning to stop pushing and I'm saying to Kenny don't push she goes nah th things for half out right mm. so um, and my instinct was I still felt like I wanted to cut it like it was it was so like really tight mm. and um, Karen come the midwife comes running over and she said the cords around his neck we need to cut it and I wanted to give her the fucking told you so <laughs> as well like, I could have done this for, I could have done this two minutes ago you told me not yeah, to yeah, this. and so she said Go to the back of my hatchback. Um, there's a medical, a green bag, and there's a medical kit in there. So I go to the back of her catch bag. That's the day I found out not only is she a midwife, she was also the manager for Kiri Kiri Under 11's rugby team, and all of their jerseys are in there. The cones are in there. There's rugby balls. There's, and I'm just ripping shit out of the way to try and find this green bag. <laughs> and I find this green bag. I come back, and she said, "What took you so long?" I was like, "I could have cut this two minutes alone ago." And all she did was like literally slid the scissors right in where I kind of had already thought I would and she cut it and then I said what now and she said just drive I said your car's open and it's raining she said I don't care just drive and she was kneeling in the, the well of the car in front of Kayleen Kayleen was laid back Shaw was out this is where I realised um, um, we had a boy uh, but he wasn't moving he was purple like he was, he was like breathing or crying no no nothing, no. No, oh. nothing. so it was, an, it was it was pretty full on I didn't feel like, she, I was like, she, she turned the heater off. She said, turn the heater on to full and drive. So I turned the heater on to full. And I was driving and it's driving rain. She said, get to the hospital as fast as you can. And she picked up the phone and she rang ahead to the hospital. And I was watching her hand trembling. And she was like, we've got a baby not breathing. And I was like, and I could see she was panicked. Mm. Like she was, the, and, and this is a midwife, you know, the most together awesome people that do this awesome job and I could see her panicking. I was like, shit, he's dead. Mm. No, he's dead. And then we get to the corner and I'm going way too fast for the corner. 
because I'm looking at him going, oh shit, dead baby. Car crosses up <laughs> um, and it, it, she kind of loses grip of him. She, she was whacking him. like She was slapping him on the back like hard to try and get him to breathe. He kind of squirts out and hits his head on the roof and starts crying. He's alive, wow. yeah. And every time I drive that stretch of road, it's like a kilometre. And for that whole kilometre, there was no noise, no movement, nothing. Not until we got to the corner and I ended up on the wrong side of the road. And the midwife kind of lost grip while she was trying to whack him and he bounced his head off the roof and started screaming. And um, yeah, he, he carried on cry, crying for the next four years. Oh, just like his dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, fuck, that's terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That's but anyway, yeah, yeah, my man. And again, Mostly when I talk about these moments, it's like in a comedic, because uh, it is crazy. Like, and yeah. when everything works out good, you can joke about yeah. that, that sort of shit. But well, I suppose no. it's the nature of a, a platform like podcast where you get yeah. to go back and uh, reflect and go back in a, a yeah. detail. It's a lot, man. It's yeah, a lot well, to well, do well it's, it's not. A, I mean, I've, I've told that story that many times to a, um, you know, whether it's a public speak, a speaking gig yeah. or um, a, in an interview, but it, it's a soundbite, you know, mm. it's a soundbite. You're not. You're not actually taking yourself back there. Yeah. Or well, if it's on, like, if you're, if you're on, say, The Rock or something, or on, yeah. um, you're on the AM show this morning yeah. on TV, they want a 20 second answer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, that's, uh, and I'm not very good at those, sorry. So. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I appreciate you. Yeah. Pr- appreciate it. Shit, this is um, officially the longest podcast we've ever done. It's 207. Yeah, far There's far still far. so much more to talk about. We might have to do a part to another time. Mm. But I, I, sure. one thing I like to speak with all, all my guests is about, like, mental health. How's your mental health been over the years? Um, it's been mostly good. Yeah, mostly good. Yeah, mostly up and down. I think being busy has helped. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there is that whole thing when you're when you're so busy, and it's not. And don't get me wrong, this is not necessarily a good thing because burnout's a real thing, and I've mm. had it. You know, I've, I've I've had it bad. Um, you're you're too busy doing the next thing to actually go. Hey, hang on. Um, is everything okay? You know. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so so some lows. Um, but um, what I figured out is it doesn't take much to fill my cup. Mm. Like taking half a day to go free diving, just um, being immersed in the ocean. I can't talk to anyone. Like there's no noise, just me. Ocean. Um, I don't have to get a fish. Um, I usually, well, you know, I, I like to make people happy, so I'll usually um, grab a couple of crays for some of the a lot of the local kaimata or some of the old people that I know, because um, that gives me a kick. And I'll, I'll just go about that process. I'm just swimming in the ocean and I can lose three or four hours. I'm good for like literally having a full schedule going hard out for weeks. Um, but if I, if, I, if I put that on the back burner, and I, I'm guilty of doing it, I'm probably guilty of doing it at the moment, mm. I get tired. I get more emotional when yeah. I'm tired. Good and bad emotions as well yeah. um, uh, when I'm tired. Um, but if I make that point um, of going, right, today... I'm not going to do something to make anyone else happy. I'm going to go for a dive. Look after yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Cups filled. Like, um, and, and, but that's just what works for me. You know, I know a lot of um, people find help talking to other people and all that sort of stuff. It's great. I, I don't really. Mm. A, not that I don't find um, it useful talking to people. It is. It, it really is. I just kind of choose. I don't. And I, I can't put a finger on why I don't do that. Um, um, because I, th- I, th- I think how we were how yeah. how we were yeah. raised in that yeah. generation it is mm. harder harder mm. to talk. So you, you don't have you don't have any real good mates that you can go out on the boat with and have some real talk oh, with. I've got really good mates, yeah. and and I know that um, push comes to shove, like those those guys got my, got my back. Yeah. But I still, you know, and it sounds stupid, and like they'll kick my ass for saying this, but you, you don't want to burden people or anything, mm. you know, like. Um, you want to be that guy that uplifts everyone else, not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm sort of in, I'm in two minds about that because I know it's good to yeah, talk to your friends about this sort of stuff, but then they're, they're not fucking trained. No, like, they're, they're not. Like, like if I was heavily pregnant, you know, would I go to you or would I no, go to you? No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, like, I have spoken to um, professional people and not like psychiatrists, but I've been to the GP. I'm like, look. I'm stressed out. I've got all of this on, you know. I get, I get, when I when I get really tired, like I kind of mean at the moment, like I get emotional. I've got these mood swings, and then like, oh, you know, I'm like, what's wrong with me? You just need to go and talk to someone. So they, they just send me off to like literally like a local nurse that's been trained the basics in it, and having a stranger, you know, way easier. 
you know, like, mm. like way easier to talk to a stranger than, than one of my mates. Yeah, um, also they're, they're trained, so they, yeah. they can give you like a different angle or a different right. perspective or a different way of looking at it. And yeah, and you don't get like, it's not like you, I, well, for me, you come out with these like life changing, this is going to reset my mind. You've just let it go. You've, mm. you've spoken about it. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Thanks for sharing that because yeah. the, the, the Maddie Watson that everyone in New Zealand knows, it, it, like he's a guy where it seems like everything's water off a duck's back. You know, the, yeah. oh, I, I hit my scrotum and yeah, yeah. <laughs> then yeah. I delivered my baby yeah. and then yeah. I went on letterman. And in, <laughs> and, in, and in retrospect, those things are all, like I say, cool comedic yeah. things <laughs> that in a very Kiwi way are uniquely Kiwi and, um, and they're great to talk about. And, and I feel proud that, you know, th that adversity and the way that it's, kind of comes off as water off a duck's back has been the way it's been portrayed that's been that's been cool mm. um but you know if i allow myself to go back to those moments shit they were bad you know mm. bad and stressful yeah 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 you, yeah you talked about the low patches before um are like are they mainly professionally like all the setbacks that uh, you oh had no, or uh, um you know personal relationships right. well you see when things are going bad and you're in a bad frame of mind everything goes you know mm. professionally well um, if your 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 important relationships aren't good, everything else seems to be bad. You know, I was talking about that strong foundation. If that's not strong, everything else suffers. Yeah. So, um, you know, it takes me to get to just what forty eight now um, to understand that. Or maybe I probably probably about forty five. I started yeah. really understanding the the full value of that because when you're when you're in it and you're just being busy all the time it's getting that next thing done becomes the most important thing in your life because i need to clear that off my schedule i need mm. to get that done i need to get get to that goal and what i think um that i've lost sight of and i think a lot of people do that have got goals and are driven i want to do things is when you get there there's no band playing the, yeah. the, the fireworks aren't going off saying you made it and now everything's going to be easy and all of that hard work and sacrifice it's payback so i've learned to to enjoy um, things along the way. Mm. And that was happening naturally in the early years of making ITM fishing because I was allowing myself just to be in the moment. There was no expectation really other than, look, I wanted to make a good TV show. Um, and then as, you know, as things got further on and funnily enough, the more successful the show became and the more people were interested in me, the less I got to go fishing, which was, was that. I, I could be working and having that outlet at the same time. Yeah. So now I've kind of learned, okay, look, y you need to make, make that time. I haven't been lately. I, I admit it. I've, I've mm. been, and that's through, we've got staff shortages at the moment, and I've literally had to be hands, really, really hands-on in my business to make sure that this series goes out there because I want it to be the best series I've ever made, mm. like every series I do. Um, and being driven is... is uh, um, as part of what you know, my wife knows this better than I do. As part of what's allowed me to do the things that I've done, but it's also a big burden, you know. Like, yeah, it's a um, I was going to say it's a blessing and a curse. It is a blessing <laughs> it's and a exhausting. curse. Exhausting because, like, you know, I even told myself, you know what, this is going to be the last series. It doesn't matter if it doesn't rate or it's not that good. You know, I'm still going to get the the same amount of money from my sponsors. I'm still, and I'm just, I can just. And but my I, I my DNA won't allow me to do that. Mm. It has to be the very best that I can do, and the time I've got, and with the money that I've got, it has to it has to be the best I can do, and then I can go to sleep at night. Mm. Yeah, but it's um, yeah, I, I can see some parallels with you and me, and it's exhausting. Yeah, but I feel like it's going to follow you around. It's like yeah, yeah, no. you're not going to kick back and think about that homebrew thing next. There's going to no, be there's going to be something no, else in the nah, Matt Watson there story. Is, nah, there, there's going to be a few things. I'm just going to learn how to do it more on, on yeah. my terms. And like I say, just the not having a, a television deadline will be one thing. And I think um, they'll allow me to be more more creative, but more real, mm -hmm. get back to the, you know, the, you know through the process of, of making this, this documentary, which is like a real weird thing. Not many people have 20 of years of their life filmed, let alone some of the greatest things they've ever done or things they thought they could never do actually be filmed. And and so that's their kind of forever. Mm. And I've never been one to sort of look back and go, but knowing this is my last series, making the Into Deep documentary, um, you start pulling out tapes, stuff I'd never done. And I found myself just rooting for this young guy. You know, it was like another person. Mm. Like, who is this kid that thinks he can? And like, um, 
Yeah, so that's that, you, that's been a real eye opening and learning stuff about you yourself. It's you know if if not for looking at footage, I would have sat here and told you no, I haven't changed. Mm. You know, I'm still the same. I'm still the same guy that um, g- came up with an idea, a twenty-something-year-old that had this outrageous idea, and I'm still exactly the same. When I look at the footage, and I, you know, no, I've changed them. Mm. I've changed heaps. Well, yeah, of course. And when you've got a growth mindset like you do, like you're, you're always changing, and mm. you'll always change, um, you probably for the better. Yeah. More often than not. Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, you get old, you get older and wiser. You, yeah. you do. Like it's, um, yeah. What, what would you what would you say to that young fella? Like, a, I mean, it's a bit of an airy fairy question. No, but I've, um, I would. Um, I'm proud of him. Yeah. Um, Keep going, son. You're on yeah, the right track. Yeah, it's going to be fine. So, um, yeah, actually, change nothing because yeah, it's it's given me the life I've got mm. right now. Thanks, mate. Yep. Buy and buy the cheap VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because they never. Because because some You're rude. Wasting your money. Yeah, because some rude bitch is going to tell you that it's buddy, yeah. that, that it doesn't belong on television. Yeah. yeah. How old? Um. How old are the kids now? Um, daughter's 21 and son is 18. Shit, so the next step for you is going to be granddad. Yeah, I, yeah, I that, hope so. Fuck, yeah. you're going to be an emotional granddad, aren't oh, you? Oh, you're going to be good at that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it's funny because you go, you have these kids and then they, like, they grow up and you're like, geez, don't have kids. You know, like, I don't want to be a granddad. And I, you know, and now, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I still think they're, they're both too young to have kids. Just oh, they are they, now. And, but yeah, yeah, they are. But I'm thinking like yeah, the next decade or so. I know Kenny and I have already had that chat. We're like, oh, geez, grandkids would be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no pressure, Hannah and Shaw, but get breeding. <laughs> <good. laughs> <laughs> oh, how good. Yeah. What a life it's been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a life. Uh, so, so, you're ending the TV side of thing. You're putting a line in the sand there. Yeah. Financially, you've done okay out of it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you've got a beautiful house. What was it? Yeah. Building a Kiwi build building a Kiwi, a Kiwi Dream. dream yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's like it a, a grand design worthy property. It is, yeah. And, and it's got a lot of just special things that have that have gone into it through both from Kenny and myself but but the location is special the land like we like just it, it it does feel cosmic that we've ended up um there you know Kenny mm. took some convincing she's not not an ocean person but but we both love it yeah yeah oh that's really cool and m- moving forward how do you make money fishing charters public speaking um no um not not fishing charters i i still take people fishing but i do it for charity so right. i get i get auctioned off um, and people pay crazy money, and um, oh, I think the part of that crazy money is because it's for a good cause. Mm. Um, usually, not not just to come out and have a lion read and catch a fish with me. Um, Although, but d- don't be uh, yeah too self de- deprecating yeah, on that one because yeah. Um, I mean yeah yeah you're, um, you're the, you're the like you're the name that everyone thinks of when it comes to like fishing in New Zealand. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm going to be doing um, like making making media and. You know, when you've got, when you're getting four million video views a month, you can make money from that, and and the same. So really, it's no different than um, my sponsors, um, who um, I'll start. I'm gonna I'll stay loyal to them so long as you know they'd have to split up with me. Put it that way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so hopefully they don't want to break yeah, up yeah, with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And and so long as 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 they're there, um, and for the um, long haul, I'm gonna keep doing that sort of content a little bit more freer it'll be it'll be getting from the moment that we capture the footage to being seen a lot quicker and we'll we'll basically just be cutting out the the tv and and conforming to the tv side of it so i see that continuing um i'm gonna um and 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 these are decisions that are not fully made because like i'm I'm all in on making the series current series that i'm cutting at the moment Mm. so and i don't want to allow myself to think too much about beyond that. I just want to make this the best TV series and do my job, but I I, I might just um, dial back on the volume and the number of things and have more time to say yes to family, yes to my mates, um, do some of the things I've missed. Like I'm so opportunity rich from like not just cool things that my mates want to do. Oh, let's go to the rugby world cup. Let's do this or that. I mean the the people around the world will offer want to offer me free trips to come out on their super yacht and we'll fly you here and like mm-hmm. because you know this because w- when people are into fishing they really love it and so it's not just um, you know people down you know, the kid down the road that, that likes catching fish which is am- amazing in itself but people overseas are getting in touch with me and saying oh look we want to fly you to Panama to fish on this super yacht and we'll have the jet pick you up from Florida and 
can you make it in a couple of weeks? And I'm like, actually, I've got to go and do a hunting and fishing store opening in Gisborne. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you Why know, did I agree to that? <laughs> no, but I mean, that's... Um, yeah, yeah. But soon, I'm, I'm just going to try and open things up so I can say yes um, to more of those things, you know? Um, I feel like I've done the work and, uh, and I can get some some more of the treats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you've done all the all the mahi. And yeah. um, hey, thanks for coming on today and thanks for being oh, so generous you. with your time. Longest yeah. longest podcast oh, I've ever man, done by I'm, a long way. I'm bad for that. I no, shit, mate. We, we, I, I could have kept on going, but I know you've got a fucking trailer to pick up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, new boat coming. <laughs> um, but thanks for thanks for sharing your stories. You're yeah, a great yeah. storyteller. Thanks for um, showing so much vulnerability as well. Thank, thank, yeah, thanks for the tissues. Um <laughs> No, it's it's like it's really special. Like the way you've um, spoken about Kayleen. Um, yeah. By the way, my video guy for those bits who will zoom in on uh, your yeah, face. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. But um, I, you know, m- maybe one day when you're a really old man, like Hannah and Shaw or their grandkids, their, you know, their kids, your grandkids will, will watch this, and it's. Yeah. Um, I think uh, like putting myself in the position of your kids, like to see your dad talk about you know, your mum that way. I think yeah. it's really fucking special special and you're so lucky to have someone um, like her in your corner yep. and vice versa yep absolutely and I'm not going to talk about it again because because <laughs> my, my, <laughs> my tissue's done mate <laughs> alright Matt Watson you're a great New Zealander thank you for everything you've done over the last couple of decades and uh, best of luck um, can't wait to follow you on, oh what's the digital platform uh, ultimatefishing.tv and um, yeah if you could um, follow my socials as well because that's all part of this being able to say to my sponsors look there's this many people and they're actually watching my stuff and it means I get to keep going so please do yeah Ultimate Fishing TV and uh, we'll have a link to all all the awesome. socials in the, in the bio thing yeah. Um, but yeah hey good luck for whatever's next mate I'm sure you're going to be brilliant at it awesome.